Tick-tock, time to rock. Good evening, good morning, good afternoon to everyone who's watching from all around the world. All the billions of D. Wood and Sam Shamoon fans <coughs> who are watching from all around the world. <coughs> well, ladies and gentlemen, sometimes people say stupid things in the chat and uh, had some comments from uh, Marvel MCU, who is a... Muslim in the chat, and he was saying some pretty standard things, but I realized we hadn't really talked about jihad in a while. Sam's, when is the last time we talked about Oops. jihad? Man, I haven't talked about that in ages. I usually don't. <clears throat> and That's your cup of tea, bro. And, I and, usually don't talk about and it. And note, notice what happens, right? Notice what happens. We decide that we're going to go live. We're going to go live and... We're going to talk about some Muslim criticisms of the Bible or some Muslim criticisms of the gospel or some Muslim criticisms of Jesus' death and resurrection or the Trinity. And then some Muslims in the chat have to open their mouths about some other topics that forces us to correct them yeah. by addressing their book and their prophet and their history of uh, jihad. And then they complain that we're we're going after them, right? I mean, it's yeah. it's just amazing. Wow. <clears throat> hey, Marvel MCU, you out there? How you doing, Sam? The um, well, glory to Jesus Christ. You know, every time David, and this is not a lie, and I want people to hear this. Every time David gets me involved in one of his projects to do something, the spiritual attack, spiritual warfare, <clears throat> becomes very bad. Last night, I started feeling under the weather, started getting sick. Maybe I got COVID-19. God's will be done. My throat is very bad right now. And then, David, on my live stream, the one I did, mm -hmm. my youngest daughter, my baby, wouldn't stop calling me because she wanted me to talk to her because she's missing me. As I'm doing a live stream, and you saw all the th other things that we can't mention on the air, attack after attack after attack. So, folks, if you don't believe that Satan is real and the attacks are real, Start doing ministry, I promise you. <clears throat> if you're doing ministry for the glory of Jesus Christ by the power of the Holy Spirit, and you're doing it effectively, watch how Satan tries to make your life miserable and all hell breaks loose. But that's where you need to remain faithful. We beg the Lord Jesus to cover us by his blood, fill us with the Spirit. Lord Jesus, save us from the evil one and empower us to go even harder against the kingdom of darkness by the power of the Holy Spirit. We love you, Lord Jesus. Be glorified. In these sessions in jesus name it's real bro it's real all right i am working to engage slow mode here it's funny if i put on slow mode <clears throat> there are people who will complain that there's slow mode and if i don't put on slow mode people complain yeah. that there's no slow mode <laughs> yeah by the way as you're doing that someone just said I think it's an important question. Eric Braun said, my dad is in uh, uh, palliative care. Palliative care, I guess mm -hmm. I would pronounce it. He is not born again, but he believes in Jesus dying for our sins. Now, here's where I'm confused, Eric. How do you know he's not born again? <clears throat> born again is not something that you can see because it's an inward work of the grace of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit transforms you spiritually, and you can't see that work because it's a work that's invisible to the human eye. But it's a work that the Holy Spirit does nonetheless, because the Holy Spirit is real. He is God. The God of the Bible is real. Now, you see the fruits of it. One of the fruits of being born again, one of the fr fruits of being born of the Spirit is that you trust in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. You confess that Jesus died for your sins, and you're hoping in him and what he did to save you, and you love him. So when you say he's not born again, that's kind of confusing. How do you know that? I mean, you just said... And we trust in Jesus' name, Lord Jesus, bless his Father, visit him in your love and compassion and mercy, and visit us and our loved ones, in my case, my daughters, for your glory, Lord Jesus, because you are risen, you are Lord, and salvation is found only in you, the Father's beloved Son. So this is where I'm kind of confused. When you said, he believes in Jesus dying for his sins, but he's not born again. How would you know that? Born again is a work you don't see with the human eyes, but you see the fruits of it. You see the result of it. A life change and a life that clings to Jesus Christ, even though we do it imperfectly. Thank you, Magdalene. Lord bless you, sister. Lord bless every one of you. I need my prayers for my help, as does David, as do our family members, as do our children and his spouse. So, amen. 
All right, so ladies and gentlemen, the, the plan here is, oh, and little side note, little side note. Uh, my internet for no apparent reason is running about 1 20th of its normal speed. So I'm getting oh. notifications at my, uh, and then I just check my internet speed. It is running uh, slower than I've seen it in a long, long time. So uh, anyway, po point is there could be some technical difficulties along the way. We might be uh, buffering a little little more than, than normal or something like that. And so uh, we'll just keep working through that unless it starts cutting out and stuff. But um, uh, yeah, so we got some comments from Marvel MCU. Has anyone seen him here? We told him that we we're going to talk about him tonight. We we're going to respond to his claims tonight in the chat and you uh his fellow muslims in the chat are welcome to defend his position as well but this isn't something this isn't something that should take terribly long so we're going to look no, at a few yeah. yeah we're going to look at a few of his comments we're going to respond to them and if muslims have any good points that we need to address then we'll continue with this for a little while uh if not and everyone can see where the evidence actually points then we will probably uh, we'll probably wrap up the uh, the jihad section after a little while, and then probably finish up those clips of Adnan that we didn't get to yeah. last time. All right. So does that sound good, everyone? If so, then we're Amen. going to we're going to get started here. Yeah. May the Lord Jesus bless uh, this session for His glory. Fill us with the Spirit. Bless the people and mm -hmm. strengthen the connection so that Satan doesn't mess with that to de deter us from glorifying Jesus Christ. And you had a great mm -hmm. night yesterday. You had over eighteen hundred with Rashid. Yep. Brother Rashid. Matter of fact, speaking of Brother Rashid, Abu <laughs> Dude, I laugh every time I see this dude's name. It's Apu Bakr Al Puff Daddy. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Who says David Wood and uh Sam Shamoon last night uh you said that Brother Rashid would be on your Mount Rushmore of Christian uh Islamic outreach apologetics. Who would the other three be? Um, yeah, I'd have to think Abu about it. Zachariah, right? Father Zachariah is obviously one yeah, of them, yeah, right? Yeah, uh, probably be Sam Shamoon, Brother Rashid, Zachariah, uh, Zachariah Boutros, and I don't know. You can't say, you can't say, you can't say Christian Prince because I don't know what he looks like, right? Yeah, yeah. You can't oh, put it, you can't, yeah. you can't put his face up there. Yeah, the, the Mount Rushmore, you know, you know, uh, now I got it. I didn't, I know, I thought, he, okay, I see. Oh, yeah. You know what Mount Rushmore is? <clears throat> yeah, no, I didn't yeah. know what he meant. I was yeah. thinking like Mount Rushmore, like we're the bomb, we're like, you know, impenetrable mountains destroying. No, 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 no. But, Mount Rushmore, he's got the four faces up yeah, there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You understand that, Sam? You got George got Washington, it. Thomas Jefferson, Teddy Roosevelt, Abraham Lincoln, and they represent different things uh, about, about America. So, yeah. Yeah, that's what? a good question. Now I'm just thinking, thinking to myself, that's a good question. Who would I have there? I mean, uh, modern times, Abuna Zakaria, definitely. His face would be there. Man, that is a good question. Man, you, you, you stumped me there. Here, 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 I, I mean, here's here's what's interesting. I mean, it seems like it's going to come down to, seems like it's mm -hmm. going to come down to modern times. Because, you know, it's, even though you have really, uh, really cool people of the past, it's just yeah. the... the you know, so you have like John of Damascus in the past, and you have yeah. you know people like hundred years ago and stuff like that. Abu Kora, yeah, you had another but, one. Abu Kora was a great one, yeah. But as far as getting the information out there, it's just hard to compete with people who have access to modern technology and yeah. can, and could do shows for years, like um, like uh, Zachariah Boutros or or you know have the internet like this. So anyway, all right, well let's go ahead and look at a couple of the claims. They're not they're not terribly difficult. I've not even shown these to Sam, but uh, Sam prepared to be overwhelmed. Shocked and rocked, friend. <clears throat> um, all right, here we go. Uh, Marvel MCU, uh, responding to Hindu historian here, says, Not for all time, bro. It clearly says in Quran not to start the fight. First of all, of Surah 9 was written... Oh, okay. Not to start the fight first. All of Surah 9 was written yeah. in war. <clears throat> So uh, I'm guessing that Hindu historian had said that uh, basically something along the lines of the final marching orders of the Quran are to fight. So this is an ongoing order and looks like Marvel MCU was responding. Not for all time. It clearly says in the Quran not to start the fight first. And uh, Sam, he's got a point. The Quran does say don't start the fight first. And so, man, we're going to have to figure out how to, how to address that. And he says all of Surah 9 was written 
in war. All of Surah Nine was written in war, yeah. so it's written in the context of war and so on. Uh, anyway, uh, yeah, boy, we're so. just gonna we're just gonna go. The, all of the all of three of his comments that I took screenshots of are uh, pretty similar, so we're just gonna look at all three of them now, and then uh, you can take it, and I'll jump in, and we'll just keep going. Yeah. Um, so, our, oh, what's that? Do you have a comment? Wait, no, 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 I'm waiting. no, no. Let me know when you want to, okay. because it's it's tiring answering the same objections over and over again. But yeah. I realize not everyone has watched your sessions or yep. your debates or mm -hmm. listen, you know, read our yep. material because it's not, but anyway, it's worth repeating yep. for the glory of Jesus Christ. So mm -hmm. yes, what was the next point? Go ahead. Yep. So the next one, he says, why can't people understand that the Quran was written in war? It also, uh, say, don't start the fight first. Don't start the fight first. So he, now he, so notice first it was a uh, Surah nine was written in war. Now it's the Quran was written in war. And then let's check the, uh, check the next comment here. Yeah. We have, uh, I am not ignorant. <clears throat> I am not ignorant you for yourself because I had posted a comment. And I said, look, you're, you're either, you're either ignorant of what your Muslim sources actually say, or you're being deceptive. <clears throat> and I said, we'll address them. And he said, I'm not ignorant. You for yourself know that the whole Quran is written in time of war. And you know, the passage don't start the war first. I do know the, I do know the passage that you're referring to. Um, but he's saying, now he's saying the entire Quran was written in a time of war, not just Surah 9, the entire Quran. So uh, any passages in the Quran that are talking about violence, you have to understand that this is only talking about a, a, a context of war. All right, Sam, do you have an idea yeah. of what he said here? Do you have an idea? Yeah. All right. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, is he uh, right? Uh, yeah. Oops. Of course, David. If he was right, we wouldn't even be having this lime stream. But yeah, he's right. Surprise! Of course he's not right. We obviously know he's not right, which is why we devoted this session to trying to refute this canard. And folks, I know you're going to get tired. You're going to get tired of me keep saying, yeah, go read these articles. The reason why we wrote these articles is to put this information in your hands so you can use it effectively for the glory of Jesus Christ to show what Muslims either... Uh, to show Muslims that they're either ignorant of their sources or deceitful, deceptive, dishonest. Because he just said chapter 9, the entire chapter was revealed in the context of, of war, in the context of fighting. Actually, pick up any commentary, commentary, Ibn Kathir. And I have this all in articles. David has it in articles. He's even got a PowerPoint, right? You got a PowerPoint pre presentation on offensive jihad. You got videos on this. The fact of the matter is, according to the Muslim sources, Chapter 9 was composed after Muhammad had already captured Mecca. Folks, please remember this point. I have an article. It's quite lengthy at that time. I didn't know about splitting articles in multiple parts because people don't read lengthy articles. But God willing, I plan on going back and breaking them up into smaller parts because these <clears throat> articles need to be read to be used for the glory of Jesus. If you read what the commentators say, Muhammad had entered Mecca. He had entered Mecca, and instead of killing the Meccans for refusing to submit to his sovereignty, and by the way, we're going to show that according to Muslim sources, that Muhammad was the antagonizer. He's the one who antagonized and threatened the Meccans, the pagans, even though they went out of their way, above and beyond what Muslims would endure, if we were in Mecca today, to try not to come to blows with Muhammad. The Muslim sources, any source, you want to read Ibn Ishaq, Tabari, will say that when Muhammad preached about Allah, the sources say that the Meccans were hearing him out and didn't have a problem with it. The sources then say that when Muhammad started attacking their gods and making fun of their family values and traditions, that's when they got upset. And I'm not making it up. This is in Ibn Ishaq. This is in Tabari. This will be in Ibn Kathir. Read any Muslim source that talks about the biography of Muhammad. When Muhammad claimed to be a prophet and what happened to him for those 13 years in Mecca before he migrated to the north to Medina and became head of state 13 years later. It says that when he preached Allah, they would listen to him. And I have the citations right here. I'm not mm -hmm. making it up. It's on answeringislam.net also on my blog, and also on AnsweringMuslims.com. It's the moment when he started attacking their gods and goddesses and their family traditions. They got upset, but they still didn't attack him. They went to his uncle, Abu Talib, and said, look, for, for God's sake, you know, for the sake of Allah, because according to the sources, they also believed Allah among 360 deities. Tell your nephew to stop attacking our gods and stop attacking our family traditions. He wants to talk about Allah, let him do so. 
We even we'll even give him an ear. We're interested in what he's got to say about Allah. But please stop stop him from attacking our gods, goddesses, and our family traditions because we don't want any problems with you or your nephew. And now, David, can I ask you a question before I move on to the historical context of chapter nine? Mm -hmm. If you're in Mecca today, how long do you think you would last saying Muhammad is a false prophet? Um, maybe, probably, honestly, I think I think I could if I could move around pretty quick. I think I could get away with it for like maybe two or three minutes. You know, if I'm like moving and dodging and stuff like that. But I think as soon as I, as soon as I start yelling at people, are gonna pummel me. See? You know what I mean, so not only pummel you, they'll call you. Mm -hmm. And not only will they will they n not pummel you but kill you. Mm -hmm. You like you said, could you last thirteen years like Muhammad did? No, no, no. That's what I mean. That's what I mean. See, Muhammad lasted thirteen minute. I mean, thirteen years among the pagans of Mecca as a Muslim, and Muslims were complaining about uh, how oppressive they are because he lasted thirteen years until he had to leave. But yeah, I would say maybe two or three minutes if I were if I were really moving. Maybe, you know, if uh, if I were, if I were like a really fast guy and could run, then I could say something for yeah. I might get away. I might get away with it for like thirteen minutes now. But that that's the that's the that's the irony, isn't it? The the Muslims for the past fourteen centuries they've complained about the intolerance of the pagans of Mecca, even though Muhammad preached a uh, preached Islam in Mecca and eventually openly was was mocking their gods and their goddesses and he still made it there for 13 years but today if i were to uh criticize the religious beliefs of the people of mecca i be mm. i would be insanely tough and fast if i lasted 13 minutes and muslims <laughs> muslims do not understand the hypocrisy here oh look at those guys they're so intolerant muhammad lasted 13 years oh today you wouldn't even last 13 minutes uh, it's so much. It's so much better. It's amazing stuff. Oh, let, yeah, whoa, so, whoa, 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 whoa! Side whoa, note. Yeah. I know. I know. I know. We were. Uh, I know where we're. Uh, I know we were on a roll here, just getting started. I know it's. Uh, I know it sucks to have to go off onto a completely different topic for a moment. But when I see something like this, we have to. So pause that thought. We will continue. But I know that you will want to address this uh, comment, Sam. This is from Samir Khan. Samir Khan, Samir Khan said, I am a Muslim recently turned atheist. I have been watching David Wood quite a while. I have started reading the Bible and it's a wonderful experience. How Where's can I on? get more close to Christ and his teachings? So I'm assuming that we will, I'm assuming that that's the kind of comment we would want to pause for to address that. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord Jesus Christ, brother that the Holy Spirit has opened your heart and your mind to the truth of the gospel, that you've left Islam and now are hungry for what you're finding in the gospel. So he just said he's been reading the Bible. He's been falling in love, right? Let me read what you just said. Yeah, David, mm -hmm. I have started reading. Yeah, see? Wonderful experience. How can I get close? Glory to God. That's the work of the Holy Spirit in you, brother. Because our goal here is to get people to leave Islam but not remain neutral. We want them to fall in love with Jesus Christ. We want them to come and know Jesus Christ, and fall in love with Jesus Christ, and serve Jesus Christ. So, how can I get more close to Christ? Well, number one, you're on the right path. You're reading his word. So I hope he's listening. He I'm is, sure he's still here. He's like, Samir, here's my advice to you. Number one, the fact that you're reading the Bible, you are getting close to Jesus Christ. Because according to the words of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, when you pick up that book, God speaks to you. And you can find that stated by our Lord in Matthew 22, verses 31 to 32, where he was talking to the Sadducees, a group of Jews, and he said that when they read the Old Testament, God is speaking to them. And that's not just the Old Testament, that's for the New Testament. So when you read the Bible or you hear the Bible being read, God is speaking to you. So now what I ask you to do is now pray and say, God, if you're real and Jesus is Lord, help me now to understand this book and give me the grace to trust in Jesus and to walk in obedience with him. So pray that prayer, because it's, although you said you're an atheist, you're saying you want to draw closer, closer to Christ. So that means technically you're not really an atheist, because you believe in Christ and want to draw closer to him. So now speak to him, because the message of the Bible is Jesus isn't simply a historical figure, someone who walked this earth. 
Jesus is the risen Lord. He died. He rose again physically. He ascended into God's heavenly presence, where he's there in his physical body, now made immortal, a body that can't die, seated on heaven's throne with all the inhabitants of heaven, seeing him and worshiping him. And from heaven, he hears you. He hears you. If you believe what the Bible says, that he's risen, he's alive. And because he's alive, he hears you. So cry out to him saying, Jesus, I want to draw closer to you. Reveal yourself to me. And Jesus, our Lord, says, anyone who comes to me, I will by no means cast them away. I will not cast him away. So you're doing good, friend. Read the Bible. You're drawing close to Christ. Hear what he has to say. Cry out to him and say, reveal yourself to me. I want to know you and I want to trust in you. And if you do, you've begun your journey with Christ. And now grow in your faith. Meaning come to understand what the Bible teaches and how to apply it. Because that's why we're Christians. We follow Christ. But to follow Christ is to know his word. And that's to know the Bible. So read the Bible. See what the Bible tells you. What you're supposed to do. What you shouldn't do. How to speak to God. How to live God, for God. And how to make him happy and delighted over your life. And find like-minded Christians like you did here. Right here. You're on a good channel. Most of the people here are followers of Jesus, who love Jesus, start interacting with them, start fellowshipping with them, right? Ask them questions. You can ask us, right? Until you can find a local church, because I don't know what your situation is, but pretty much the world's on shut, shut down. When, by the grace of God, if and when, by the grace of God, <clears throat> everything goes back to normal, COVID-19 is no longer a threat, and we can now gather publicly Find you a local church, a church that believes the Bible is absolutely true. It's authoritative. It is the Word of God. Believes that God is the Trinity. Jesus is a God-man. And then start attending that church. Start learning from the pastor. Start praying with the believers in that church and be involved so that this is how you're going to grow. So this is how you embark on this journey, right? Mm -hmm. Keep reading. Speak to Jesus. Start fellowshipping with like-minded Christians and get involved in a local church so you can grow and have a family that you can call your own. And that's why Christ came to save not just individuals. He came to save individuals to form a spiritual family, sons and daughters of the living God, brothers and sisters of Jesus Christ, born of the Spirit of God, who love the Lord, serve the Lord, and love one another, and depend on one another as a family united to God by faith in Christ, sealed by the Holy Spirit. That's what you need to do. All right, Samir. Um, if you have more questions, let us know. Um, we're going to let. Matter of fact, let's uh, let's cover a couple comments real quick here. Uh, we have uh, truth and courage. <laughs> truth and courage here says, uh, if Allah wanted, He could have wiped all, out all of you, but Allah is testing you, the fruits of which you bear. So Allah could have wiped us out. <laughs> truth and courage couldn't couldn't. I mean, instead of wiping us out. Uh, and instead of testing us, couldn't he have given us the slightest bit of evidence that his religion is true? I mean, the slightest one little one, one argument that doesn't fall apart the second we start examining it. Right. Do you understand? I mean, is, is that what you're telling me? So Allah tells us that Muhammad is the, the great pattern of conduct. And we start examining that. We find that Muhammad had sex with a prepubescent girl and that he uh, took the wife of his own adopted son and uh, that he would have sex with his slave girls. And when he got caught, he would uh, say that he was going to stop. And then Allah would tell him to to keep going and stuff like that. Really? I mean, it's like it's, no one would want this guy as their next door neighbor around their around their daughter and so on. Um, but that's what happens. Allah gives. That's the evidence that Allah gives. And then what else do you guys say? Oh, the Quran's been perfectly preserved. We spend five to ten minutes of research looking through the Muslim sources, and you find out entire chapters of the Quran came up missing, large passages came up missing, verses were eaten by a sheep. Every single argument, every single argument you give us falls apart the second we yeah. start examining it. That's so so is that how Allah is testing us? Allah is saying, let me show them that there is absolutely no evidence for my religion. And that all the available evidence is actually against my religion. And let me show them that my religion completely self-destructs in multiple ways. For instance, I affirm the scriptures of the Jews and Christians, even though the scriptures of the Jews and Christians say that I'm a liar. 
let me give them an example of a religion that falls apart, that self-destructs, and even if it didn't self-destruct, it falls over at the slightest breath of any sort of research. Let me give them that and see if they believe. Up, oh, they're not believing. They're actually thinking. Shame on them. They're not good. Um, yep. Yeah. And interesting. Again. By the way, the, by the way, David, the mm -hmm. passages he's referring to two chronic passages. Even though he didn't mention mm -hmm. those passages, folks, I want you to see what he said. If Allah wanted, he could have wiped you out. Now, this is also in reference to Jesus being wiped out if God wanted. God wanted to wipe out Jesus and his mother in mm -hmm. chapter 5 of the Quran, if you read 17. But specifically, if this is alluding to, and I want to show you how this, excuse me, backfires against Muhammad and his Quran. If you go to chapter 16, verse 61, and chapter 35, verse 45 of the Quran. Chapter 16, verse 61, guys. 1661 and chapter 35 verse 40, 45 it says if Allah were to call mankind into account for their wrongdoing he would not leave a single creature on the earth he would wipe them out but he grants them a period a respite in other words in his mercy he allows them to linger on until the day of judgment so that's 1661 and 3545 notice the logical implication of those statements see we like to take the objections of Muslims and turn it against them to take them captive for the glory of Jesus, to show how even in the Quran, there's enough truth in the Quran, though it's not the word of God, still, it does say a lot of truthful things. After all, anytime the Quran agrees with the Bible, it's got to be true, because the Bible is true. Now, <clears throat> there are stuff in the Quran that you can use to bring them to the supremacy of Christ. For instance, if these two passages are true, that Allah will not leave a single creature on earth if he were to call them into account for their wrongdoing, meaning every human being every creature on earth is evil enough to merit destruction then muhammad ended up making jesus our lord and his blessed mother divine beings in the flesh why do i say that don't take my word for it go to chapter 3 read verse 36 chapter 3 verse 36 of the quran chapter 3 verse 42 of the quran give you the references chapter 3 verse 42 and then chapter 19 verse 19 Read what the Muslim expositors say about those passages. According to the Muslim expositors, Jesus and Mary are the only two human beings whom Satan could not touch when they were born, even though he successfully touched every other child of Adam, which means he also touched Muhammad and Muhammad's parents and pricked them and made them cry, except Jesus and Mary. In chapter 3, verse 42, Mary is said to be pure, purified, of all impurities, and the Muslim expositors say she was absolutely pure and sinless, as was Jesus our Lord in chapter 19, verse 19. Now, David, remember, you're the logician. If the Quran is true, that there's not a single creature on earth who is sinless and hasn't done any wrong in order to avoid God's wrath and destroying them if he wanted to, but then Jesus and Mary are absolutely pure and sinless, never sin, absolutely pure, if the Quran is consistent, isn't this then the case that what the Quran says about Mary and Jesus shows that Mary and Jesus must be more than human, they must be truly divine and not mere creatures, if those statements of the Quran are true? Yeah, if you actually, uh, if you actually put them together and uh, applied, <laughs> applied the laws of logic, but uh, we know from experience there aren't a lot of uh, people in the Islamic community willing to do that. But yeah, go, go, ahead, go, ahead, go ahead and summarize that for them. One more time. The Quran says what about all creatures? That if Allah were to call into account a person for his wrongdoing, he would not save a single creature on the earth. 1661, 35, 45. So Allah would destroy every creature, every created being, because, says. because no creature is innocent before him. That's right. Just what he says. Okay. You know, just, I'm and, and, then, and then what were you pointing him? What were you pointing out about Jesus? In not, chapter not, three, verse not, a, not according to Christianity. No, no, according, no, according to the Quran and the Hadith. Yes, Quran, chapter three, verse thirty-six, chapter three, verse forty-two, chapter nineteen, nineteen, and the Muslim exp exposition. Jesus and Mary were saved from Satan, touching them at birth. The only human beings that were born that Satan could not touch. He touched everyone, even Muhammad and Muhammad's mother and Muhammad's father. Right, mm -hmm. and Mary has has been purified from conception. Says that Allah has purified thee. It says in three forty two, the angels say to Mary, "O Mary, Allah has chosen you, and purified you, and chosen you above all women." And Jesus in nineteen nineteen is a pure son. So Jesus and Mary are absolutely pure and sinless. There you go. 
Do you guys understand the point, or was that uh, uh, is that too much for uh, for truth and courage there? I don't know. I don't know if truth and courage uh, realize what just hit him. But that's the thing. That's the beauty of Jesus, our Lord, because He's real. He's risen. He's alive, and the Bible's His word. He makes it so easy for His servants to show the lies, the falsehood of all these ideologies, and especially Islam. Islam is perhaps, in my view, maybe because I've studied it with great depth, the easiest religion to destroy and dismantle, mm -hmm, right? Mm -hmm. I'm sure even atheism is a little harder than, than Islam. Mm -hmm. That doesn't mean atheism can't be refuted. It can. Anything that sets itself up against Jesus is false and <clears throat> must collapse by the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. But Islam is, in my view, maybe because I've spent so much time studying, it's so easy to dismantle. Yeah. The real miracle is that people believe it's a miracle. That's the miracle. Yeah, it's like if you, if you, if, if when a Muslim says, ha, how can you refute Islam? You're like, uh, pick a way, right? Pick one of the, pick one of the dozen ways we, we can. What, what, I mean, one day, we did one, we did one day of shows and we covered 50 different reasons Islam is false. We went through 50 arguments against Islam doing shows. Um, and uh, we need to do something like that again one day. That'd be that'd be pretty fun. Uh, shout out yeah. to uh, Heistapaska01 for joining the Boom Squad. Um, and uh, a couple comments real quick, and then we'll jump back into the topic. Um, Yankee with no brim keeps saying over and over again every live stream, I see you debate Muslims and atheists, but would you refute Judaism? Why in the name of common sense would I want to talk would I want to take time away from discussing Islam and refuting Islam when there are 1.6 billion adherents of it who are commanded to violently subjugate the world even though there are many who who, who don't follow it seriously? Um, why would I want to take time away from that and start talking about Judaism when there are people who know far more about Judaism than I do, like Dr. Michael Brown, yeah, who can deal with it far more effectively than I ever could? Why would I want to say, oh, here's this thing that is no, that is no threat to you at all. Uh, focus on that. Focus on that thing, even though there are people who effectively engage uh, with the beliefs uh, of that topic and in order to do that, just ignore this ideology, which is basically between, you know, represents between a fifth and a quarter of the world's population and calls for your, your annihilation. I'm under multiple death sentences from this ideology. Why exactly. in the name of common sense would you say, divert your attention from there and go after this thing, unless you're just obsessed with that other, with that other issue. And if so, just get off my page. I don't care what it is. I, I mean, the, the same thing. If you started saying, David, why aren't you going after Taoism? Why aren't you going after Taoism, David? Well, because I deal with Islam. <laughs> is that a good enough reason? And finally, we have a, a, a Fadhili Washburn keeps posting, David, I have a Muslim that wants to debate you in a public forum. Well, there are plenty of Muslims who want to make a name for themselves and, and want to debate. Uh, Fadhila, you're going to have to explain to us why we should take this seriously. Because if we debate a Muslim that no one's ever heard of, and you 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 crush the Muslim that no one's ever heard of, everyone's the you know what the Muslims say? They oh, you went after him instead of Zakir Naik. Ha ha! You see, you're picking weak Muslims and not going after Zakir Naik. When Zakir Naik won't debate, he just he just won't. He he Zakir Naik only agrees to face people. If they've never debated before, right? He 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 has to, he has to know that. As soon as he knows that you know what you're talking about, he's not going to come near you, right? Uh, so yeah, we basically have to know what sort of uh, what sort of following uh, your friend has, because I mean, Sam keeps putting out debate challenges regularly uh, on this program. To to it's funny you're you're putting out open invitations to debate the people that Muslims keep telling us that we need to debate, right? I mean, they kept yeah. they kept posting. Why why aren't you why aren't you why aren't you debating Adnan face to face? When you keep saying, "Hey, Adnan, yeah, you're welcome. On, you're welcome on here. You're welcome on this this live stream." Adnan can call and join in this live stream, and we will set up so that people aren't shouting over each other. We'll set up some time constraints, and we'll have a nice we'll have a nice little 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 debate here. I don't I don't see what the problem is. But anyway, yeah. If, uh, if oh, by the way, David, what's interesting? Adnan came up with a video that had nothing to do with trying to refute anything you said. Mm -hmm. His latest video is the Mughal Empire book recommendations. Mm, That's awesome. all he did. That sounds like a real, 
real powerful you get, video there, man. I'm I would a- <laughs> think he would come after you and accept our challenge or to refute you and saying you are lying and you're slandering and it's misinformation. Maybe but he's, I think maybe he's learning, learning his, his lesson. Might be learning his lesson there. And uh, yeah. shout out also to uh, Big Boss joining the Boom Squad. All right, Sam, we went off on a tangent, but I believe it was an important one. Samir was asking uh, about drawing closer to Jesus. Now, we were on the issue of yeah, Muhammad yeah. antagonizing, Muhammad antagonizing, the Meccans. That's where we yes. left off. What I was saying is that you 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 said it quite clearly. Folks, don't forget. Don't lose the point because that's what Muslims do. They try to distract us to get off topic. The Muslim sources is documented in my articles. Lord willing, I'll send them later in the comments section. State quite clearly that when Muhammad preached Allah, no unbeliever had a problem with it. In fact, it, the sources say they actually listened to him. When he started attacking their gods and goddesses and their family values, they got upset, but they still didn't attack him. They went to his uncle, trying to get his uncle to appease Muhammad because they didn't want any problems. Now notice, who who is trying to be a peacemaker and refrain from coming to blows and creating a war, a fitna, and bloodshed? The unbelievers. Now, if you go to Mecca today, this is why I was asking David Wood, could you last 13 years in Mecca saying Muhammad is a false prophet? Muhammad is an antichrist, the crown is a false book. You wouldn't last 13 seconds. You'd be killed on the spot. I think I could last 13 seconds. we we got to be people of truth. I think I could run and and, and bob and weave, duck and dive, crawl under a car. I think I can make it 13 seconds. Okay. (laughs) All right. Uh, Three minutes. And yet Muhammad, for, for some strange reason, survived for 13 years. Well, put that aside. Okay, now he goes to Medina, he becomes head of state, and he gives his followers the right to defend themselves against oppression. Even though he was the oppressor, he's the one who oppressed, he's the one who robbed caravans, st- uh, stealing the property of the Meccans. And that's another thing I want you to remember. When Muhammad went to Medina, the Meccans left him alone. They didn't pursue him in Medina. They didn't seek him out or his followers to, to kill them. That's in the Muslim sources. They left him alone, good riddance for the most part. But what happened was Muhammad would send his thugs to attack and rob Meccan caravans, attack them, take their property. And on one occasion, they even end up killing some of the Meccans, resulting in the Battle of Badr. So notice who's the one who's initiating hostilities. It's Muhammad. The Meccans didn't want to have anything to do with him. Okay, now you left. Good riddance. Leave us alone. But he wouldn't leave them alone. He would attack their caravans, rob them. Take their merchandise, of course they're going to get upset, but let's put that aside. When it comes to chapter 9, I don't know of any commentator that's going to deny this. Chapter 9 was composed about a year after Muhammad had already conquered Mecca. If you re- And I have the citations from um, Ibn Kathir and Maududi, and this is something that's indisputable. And if there's a Muslim here, I want a Muslim to say, you're lying. Here's the source. Prove me wrong. Is it not true that chapter 9 was composed a year after Muhammad conquered Mecca? He conquered Mecca. Now, why is that important? When Muhammad entered Mecca, he gave them amnesty. He pretty much said, I won't kill you. You can live in Mecca, but you're going to live under my, my rules and under my authority. And they agreed. They agreed. Even though there were about 10 people that he did murder which included uh, two, two, two females who would mock him in, in poetry. But put that, aside, put, put that aside. Ten. Now, a year later, he gets this revelation in quotation marks. Chapter 9, he's no longer happy with the situation in Mecca. He's not happy that there are still unbelievers in Mecca, pagans in Mecca. So now he sends them a warning. Allah now dissolves Muhammad of any contract he has made with any of you. You have a certain period to get your house in order, become Muslims, or you're going to have to flee, or we kill you. So this assumption, this claim, this assertion, that chapter 9 was was quote-unquote revealed in the context of war, that is erroneous and fallacious because when these verses quote-unquote came down, There was no war between Muhammad and the Meccans because they had submitted to his authority. They had submitted to his headship. They had now come come under his demands, and they agreed that whatever he says goes, and yet Muhammad still wasn't happy. He wasn't happy that they were still pagans, so now he gives them the choice. 
you either become Muslim or we're going to have to kill you. So where in the world did this gentleman, Marvel, whatever his name was, where in the world did this gentleman get this information that Surah 9, at least the first 28 verses, were composed in the context of war? There was no war. Mecca had been conquered. Muhammad had taken over Mecca. The pagans had submitted to his authority. But still, he could not leave well enough alone. Why? Because Muhammad could not accept the fact that a religion other than Islam could exist in the Hejaz in the Arabian Peninsula. And the Muslim sources are quite clear. They have Muhammad saying that there won't be two religions in the Hejaz. Only one religion can flourish in the Hejaz. Hejaz means the Arabian Peninsula, Mecca and Medina. And therefore, he ordered them, become Muslim or we kill you or take off. That's historical context. Now, I can give you citations, but I think that pretty much sums it up. Yeah, we can. Uh, there's there's plenty more we can go into. I'm I'm especially interested if if we have some Muslims who want to challenge uh, the claim, guys. Guys, the, the the basic overall claim here, right, is that if you read uh, many of the verses in Surah Nine, they are not calling for defensive jihad. We understand that there are passages in the Quran that talk about defensive jihad. If someone attacks you, you can fight back. Right? We understand that. Um, we understand that there are passages in the Quran which advocate that sort of defensive fighting that, that tell you not to start the fighting first, that you know you, you can fight only if other people start it. Uh, but we understand that Islam operates under the doctrine of abrogation. That's the method of interpreting uh, of interpreting the Quran that goes back to the time of Muhammad and his companions. It's only modern westernized Muslims who think that the method of interpreting the Quran is pick the verse you like best and then use it to throw out all the rest. That's not the method of Muhammad and his companions. Their method is, yes, they understand that you have verses saying this and verses saying something else. And the question is, which one came later in different circumstances? And if you have something later and in, in those circumstances, that's what applies then. And so the commands, the, 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 the westernized Muslims, what they do is they go to the verse that they like, you know, fight people who are attacking you. And then they use that to reinterpret clear commands like Surah 9 verse 29, fight those who do not believe in Allah. All right. They use, oh, well, he says fight those who do not believe in Allah, but he must mean only fight in self-defense because that's what he said over here. Well, if he really meant what he had said earlier, why did he say it in a, in a, in a different, more, far more confusing way? All right. Why did he say it? If, if he only wanted you to understand that you're supposed to fight in self-defense, well, he'd said that years earlier. Why is he saying this new thing, which sounds like it's saying something completely different, especially when he knows he's already told people that the method of interpreting the Quran is, is, the, is the doctrine of abrogation? Why, in the name right. of common sense, would he do that, right? Shouldn't Allah have known that his greatest commentators are going to conclude that the verses in Surah 9, which command Muslims to fight people based on their beliefs, are going to lead Muslims to think that the earlier... The earlier revelation, simply advocating fighting and self-defense, that those kinds of those kinds of verses have been abrogated, and that what what applies to Muslims now and then and until the entire world has been subjugated, are these commands to violently subjugate the entire world? Doesn't Allah know that? Doesn't he? Doesn't Allah know that if he gives these extra verses where he accidentally says things that he doesn't mean? that are supposed to just be repetition, according to Muslims, are just repetitions of things that he'd already said clearly. And now he's saying things he doesn't mean. Doesn't he know that people are going to be really confused and that millions of people are going to die because of that? Mm -hmm. um, so so that's the position. So anyway, that, that that's the basic idea. And the, and the, ba the, ba the, ba the overall basic idea, ladies and gentlemen, is that during the life of Muhammad... And you find this in the Quran, you find it in the Hadith, you find it in the Sirah, you find it in the Tafsir. Wherever you go, you find out when Muhammad was a persecuted prophet in Mecca, he preached a message of peace and as far as physical confrontation, it's peace and tolerance, but I'm going to make fun of your gods, right? Uh, but other than that, don't kill me for it. Hey, you know, let's be tolerant of one another. Then later, once he had enough people around him to protect him and to fight for him, then the message changed to one of defensive jihad. So the revelations he got then promoted defensive jihad, fighting people who are messing with you, although the Islamic concept of what constitutes an attack uh, is much broader than what we think. We think of it like an army marching out against you in Islam. It's, you can even be like making fun of him or something like that. That was called for violent retaliation. Uh, but and now Muslims want to go to the passages re revealed during this period and say that was the final. Those were the final rules. Those weren't the final rules because still later, once Muhammad became the most powerful force in Arabia, that's when the message changed to fight those who do not believe in Allah. 
So we point out these verses. Surah 9, verse 29, Surah 9, verse 73, Surah 9, verse 123, which call for offensive fighting based on what people believe. And we point out, look, you've got all these verses where Muhammad, I mean, where Allah orders Muslims to fight people, but based on what they believe, we look at those verses. And then we look at Muhammad in the Hadith, where he says, I've been commanded to fight people until they say there's no God but Allah. And we ask our Muslim friends about these. Well, what do these things mean? And they say, oh, no, 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 it only means self-defense. And we can't make sense of that. And so we ask them to defend that. Uh, and it never, ever, ever goes very well. So that's what we'd like our Muslim friends to comment on. Now, if our Muslim friends want to say, hey, we're right, that's fine. We can go on to Adnan uh, Rashid video clips and discuss them. But if Muslims want to tell, want to say that we're wrong, please show us uh, where we're wrong. Let's check out a couple, yes. couple comments real quick. We have uh, Saudi here. Uh, says, atheist lady, glad to see some atheists here. But I don't really know what we are doing here. All religions don't make sense anyway. Smiley face. Well, there are a couple of reasons you're here. One, we're the best there is at what we do. <laughs> yeah. You know, if it comes to wrecking Islam, you know where you're going. There's only a handful of people who are the best of the best. There's only there's only a few people. You got you got some you've got some really really awesome people. You got you know apostate prost, uh, apostate uh, apostate prophet is awesome yeah. at, at what he does and so on. But basically, if you're talking about the people who are really really wrecking Islam. You've got you've got a couple of atheists and you've got you've got a handful of Christians and so you know I mean gosh I even have like atheist moderators on my channel right the atheists atheists love us man you know why a couple reasons Sam there are some atheists there are some atheists yeah. who actually understand you know what and I've been told this by atheists right they said look Islam is growing. I will gladly side with the Christians here, <laughs> and and that that's kind of that's kind of my view. If you have one ideology that calls for all of our violent subjugation, then we're kind of all on the same side of that of that issue, right? On that on uh, when it comes to that issue, should we be against global jihad? Yes, atheists, Christians, Hindus should all be on the same side of that issue, and that's why we can get along. That's why I can do live streams with people like the Apostate Prophet. We're we're all on the same side. Um, but there's there's another issue. It's it's kind of a deeper issue, and some atheists have actually started to realize that Christians are actually better at at defending against uh, Islam than lots of than atheism atheism as a whole is. Richard Dawkins, Richard Dawkins. I mean, gosh, who is more anti-religion than Richard Dawkins? Uh, but he said in an interview that he has mixed feelings. He's asked about the decline of Christianity in Europe. And he, see, I, he says, I have mixed feelings about the decline of Christianity in Europe because I think it might have been a bulwark protecting us against something worse. And so here's an atheist saying, gosh, I'm thinking, hmm. I'm thinking we might have actually needed those Christians to stand Thank against you. jihad because us atheists, we're not, we, we just don't do it as well. All right, so, so, uh, so our, our Saudi friend here, you're here uh, either because you like our arguments against Islam and you're trying to draw material or deep down you understand we're better we're better at doing it than you are and yes you can you can have individual atheists who are who are great at what they do but atheism as a you know the community of atheists are so divided and so flipping out over every little thing and then attacking each other they just they can never be united they can never be united to take on something like Islam so my atheist friends out there guess what you will get eaten alive without Christians on your on your side of this issue, right? You'll get eaten alive. All right. Yeah. Um, and let's see. I had another comment. Up, oh, <laughs> truth and courage. <laughs> he was saying we're drunkard men and we're lying. No, this is amazing, Sam. Every single thing you just said, you can you can show. Every single thing you just yeah. said, you can show directly from Muslim sources. And the Muslim response is, "You're lying." You're lying, right? Over and over and over again. Uh, hey, uh, truth and courage. Why don't you uh, show some courage to speak the truth, since that's your name, and go ahead and tell us what Sam just lied about. What did he lie about? Yeah. What did he lie about? Yeah, go ahead. Good. I have quotations right in front of me from Ibn Kathir, from al Dudi, from Ibn Ashaq, from Tabari. I got too many. I, In fact, I was thinking, should I read them or should I summarize? Because there's too many to read. I go, let me just sum summarize. But they're right here, finger to way. Thank the Lord Jesus for modern technology. See, the, the disadvantage with dealing with Islam, it's not just the Quran you need to memorize, it's these sources. And so you either need to carry books with you or have the internet 
so you can access these citations. Whereas the beauty of the Bible is, you just need the Bible, because the Bible provides its own historical context. Glory to the trying God, for giving us a book that's so clear. With the Quran, you cannot make heads or tails out of the Quran for most of what it says, unless you have recourse to these extra Quranic sources. And David knows fully well, and even these sources are over 100 years to 200 years to 300 years after the time the Quran was allegedly composed. So that's mm -hmm. the problem. All right. All right, guys. Now, do we have any any uh, challenges here on the claim that Islam actually calls, as part of its final marching orders, calls for violent, um, violent offensive jihad? And this is what this is what we often point out. And just so many people seem clueless about this, right? We'll point out exactly what Islam teaches about the violent subjugation of the rest of the world. We'll point out exactly what Islam teaches. And then people will straw man what we just said. And they'll say, oh, you're complaining that there's violence in the Muslim sources. But there's violence in the Bible. Our complaint was not that there's violence in the Muslim sources. That wasn't the complaint. right? If we're, if we're complaining about that, you'd have to throw out any history book that covers any war. right? Yeah. Um, our, uh, the, what, and, and really, when I'm talking about jihad and so on, I'm not, uh, that's not even an argument. For me, that's not even an argument that it's not true. Right? It's, yeah. hey, Islam calls for the violent subjugation of the world. It calls for terrorism. It calls for offensive jihad. Therefore, stop saying that Islam is a religion of peace and that it doesn't do these things. That's the point there, right? If Islam were true, then, you know, we need to convert to it and, 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 and go out and join in the violent subjugation of the, of the entire world. It's not true. We know it's not true for all kinds of different reasons. Uh, but on this issue, people just need to stop saying that it's a religion of peace and that it doesn't have anything yep. to do with these terrorist attacks. It clearly, 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 indisputably does. Um, and so, yeah, that's kind, of the, that's kind of the point there. But notice the issue here. We talk about Islam. You say, you say, what does Islam have to do with these violent attacks? Well, you read the Quran from beginning to end, and it's out of order. Once you actually put it in order, chronological order, and you understand that it operates on the principle of uh, abrogation, then you realize the last major chapter of the Quran to be revealed is Surah 9, which contains all these open-ended commands to violently subjugate the entire world you realize, wait a minute, the final marching orders of Islam are to violently subjugate the entire world when you're in a position to do so. If you're not, then nope, you claim that Islam is a religion of peace and tolerance. But if you are in a position to violently subjugate, then you do that, right? So that's the, that's what we're pointing out with Islam. In, in the Bible, you can say, ah, you know, there were times, look at, you know, the wars of Joshua. You point out, hey, there, were, there was violence in there. But if you ask, what are the final marching orders of Christians? We're commanded to love our neighbors as ourselves. We're commanded to, uh, as far as it depends on us, live in peace with all people. We're commanded to, pers we're commanded to uh, seek the good of all people. We're commanded to uh, love even our enemies. So these are, those are the final marching orders for Christians. So you take the Bible and say, what is this book commanding us now? And you take the Quran and say, what is this book commanding us now? The Quran is still calling for the violent subjugation of the entire world. The, the Bible is calling for people to love each other more. Very different, very different messages. And so if anyone wants to discuss that, we're, we, we'd be happy to do so. If not, we'll probably go on to some clips from our good friend yeah. Adnan Rashid. Yeah, I don't think anyone wants to take us up on that challenge. Smart, smart. Maybe they're learning. Maybe they're, maybe they're learning. Good. All right, I see no take her. So yeah, let's dismantle him by the grace of Jesus Christ. We praise the Lord. Lord, bring your people to listen. All right, we're going to go into Adnan. Go ahead. You ready to get and schooled by Adnan again? Yeah, school me. Give me one second. I just got to get one thing ready, but you can go ahead and play the click because I already heard it. I'll be right back. Give me one second, Blair. Blair All Blair. right. All right, ladies and gentlemen, we're going on to Adnan Rashid. We're going to see what he's got for us. And those who claim that the gospel that is being referred to in the Quran is the New Testament then are you claiming that the Quran is talking about provocative adultery? Are you, take, are, you, are you claiming that the Quran is talking about the Gospel of Mark chapter 16 verses 9 to 20 which have been omitted from many modern translations and they are no longer regarded as the original writings of Mark? Are you claiming that the Quran is actually talking about those passages? Clearly not because the Quran makes itself very clear that there are passages in the New Testament that were falsely attributed to the life of Jesus Christ and they're not true. And we have talked about one of those passages in the Quran uh, that talks about those interpolations and forgeries. 
the matter of crucifixion. The matter of crucifixion. When the Quran says, as for those who differ about this, differ about what? The author of the Quran knew that there are people who differ about the account of the crucifixion and those who differ are in conjecture. They don't know the details. They don't know what happened. How did the author of the Quran know that there was conjecture and there was difference? Do you think Muhammad could have known that? وسلم, do you think Prophet Muhammad had the ability to read the four Gospels which were not even available to Christians at the time? Many Christians had not collected those four Gospels in particular around Arabia. Maybe these Gospels did exist as a collection uh, elsewhere, maybe in Egypt, maybe in the land of Syria, but in Arabia we do not see any trace of the Gospels in uh, any other language, let alone the Arabic language. All right, so um, here, Sam, we finally got to, we finally got to, um, we finally got to uh, the passage about the woman caught in adultery in the Gospel of John and the longer ending of the Gospel of Mark. And we've got those two passages. And yeah. Anand's question was, do we think the Quran is, is, uh, is defending those and, and just to give everyone the background here sam can expand upon this but you do have the incredibly vast majority of textual variants in manuscripts of the bible the overwhelming majority are things that uh have no bearing whatsoever on us knowing yeah. what what the bible says they're either they're either completely insignificant they can't even be translated so things like spelling differences and things like sure, that yeah. um or they're things where we where they're they're so late the difference is so late that it, it it can't even be thought of as like if if something doesn't appear till the 11th century in some 11th century manuscript and all the uh, all the earlier manuscripts don't contain that well you know uh, it's 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 considered not not viable right there's there's no way that it is that could go back to the original so that's the overwhelming majority of textual variants but you do have a couple of textual variants that uh, are very early that are very early and they actually yeah. do matter not in the sense of affecting you know christian doctrine but of some you know some some story or some teaching that it, you know it actually is, is 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 giving an important story so one of those is the woman caught in adultery there are manuscripts that don't have this there are manuscripts that do have this there's a manuscript where it's actually put into uh, the gospel of luke and so you, you find it there. Notice it's not something that affects the deity of Christ or the resurrection or Jesus' death for sins or something that you still don't end up with anything um, with anything that would affect any important Christian doctrine. Nevertheless, it is an, it, it is it is an important story. And you have a, a, here again the, the the end of the Gospel of Mark, the longer ending of the Gospel of Mark. Um, you, you have you have manuscripts where. The Gospel of Mark ends with the women going out from the tomb, yeah. and they're going out to proclaim. And then you have uh, you have other you have other manuscripts where you have this this longer ending that includes more things. And the things that it that it says there are included elsewhere. But so it's, uh, here again, it's not something that affects any important Christian doctrine. But Sam Adnan is yeah. Adnan is pointing it out. He said, "Ha! Huh, do you oh, really my. think the Quran is affirming these kinds of things?" I would say. Yeah absolutely the quran is affirming this right if yes. the quran is affirming yes. the scriptures we have it's obviously affirming these texts and if allah is trying to correct these texts then he did a horrible horrible job he's no more clear here than he is on the issue of jihad muslims say allah says all these things about jihad but he doesn't really mean them yeah. and he says all these things defending the gospel and saying that we have to judge by the gospel the gospel is the authoritative inspired preserved word of god and he says all these things and muslims tell us no he doesn't mean any of that either so it's just one big mess sam what are your thoughts on uh on uh, at yeah. this point there's so much to say and i'm trusting the grace of the lord jesus christ to anoint me to say it in a clear way because i want the audience to get it you know how to respond i know how to respond <clears throat> but the focus of these sessions is to help the people listening to respond notice how he distorted chapter 4 verse 157 i'm going to talk about the variant readings in a minute he says that the latter part of the verse is not talking about the jews i'm assuming you got to that part right that was the part where he says the second part that they they follow conjecture because they're disputing uh, and so forth that they're, this dispute means their contradictions in the biblical count. Here again is a dishonest reading of chapter 4, verse 157. Folks, don't take my word for it. Guys, don't take my word for it. Go to chapter 4, verse 157 and read the verses that immediately precede 
What it's talking about is the Jewish rejection of Jesus. We need to put this passage in its historical context. I want you to understand what the author Khan is doing. <clears throat> the Jews are telling Muhammad, you want us to follow Jesus the Messiah, the son of Mary, the apostle of Allah, and believe his mother Mary was a saintly woman, when we expose him as a fraud by having him killed. If you actually read the passage, the passage is a Jewish polemic against Muhammad's prophethood. It's saying to Muhammad, how can we follow you when you're telling us to follow Jesus as a Messiah? Don't you know that we killed him, we got rid of him? Now, why are the Jews telling Muhammad? Why are the Jews telling Muhammad that we got rid of Jesus? As proof that he's a fraud. And yet, what is Muhammad's response? You didn't kill him nor crucify him for the, for the reason you thought. That's how it appeared to you. And when it says that there are differences, it's not talking about Christians. It's talking about the Jews and Christians are divided over the issue of Jesus' death. Christians are saying he died as a sacrifice for our sins, and God vindicated him by raising him from the dead. The Jew says, baloney, hogwash. He died because he's a false messiah, and God never raised him from the dead. Muhammad is not talking about Christians differing about the crucifixion. The Christians don't even come up in the conversation. He's talking about the Jews using Jesus' crucifixion as a reason to reject him as the Messiah, whereas the Christians on the other hand are saying, no, he died for our sins, and God raised him from the dead to vindicate him. That's the difference between the Jews and the Christians, not Christians and Christians. Mm -hmm. And I don't know, did you get to the clip where he's going to talk about uh, people differed about the crucifixion. Was that part of the creed? Because that's step away for. A I, Did I he mention that? No, no. I think he was just talking about. Uh, I think. Uh, I think I stopped this clip. I was letting you continue because we're just going to look at the clips anyway. But um. Yeah, okay. All right. Yeah, that's fine. Um. Because it, well, even we'll look at it because he's his point was basically their contradiction in the gospel accounts regarding crucifixion, mm -hmm. and that's what the the Quran is highlighting. No, the Quran is not. Yeah, there's talking no way in the Quran. Quran not talking about contradictions in the gospel account yeah he's talking about the conflict between the jews and christians regarding the death of christ and its significance so that's dishonest on his part yeah to appeal to variant readings as somehow vindicating what muhammad said that there are differences in the reports and therefore that's why the christians are confused this is a fact of history folks i want you to call out a non Rashid and say we challenge you to quote a single group that on the basis of the Gospels came to a different understanding about Jesus's crucifixion mm -hmm. burial and resurrection because his argument is because there are differences in the gospel reporting then the Christians were divided over the crucifixion I'm gonna call out his fraud mm -hmm. I want a non to name a group that did believe in the four Gospels and the books of the New Testament that doubted that Jesus was killed on the cross, was buried, and God raised him from the dead. What Adnan is doing dishonestly, he's alluding to second, third, fourth century Gnostic groups. This is why I gotta go into a little background. I don't wanna make it lengthy, but the background information is vitally important. Oftentimes, Adnan and Co, like he likes to use the word Co, will appeal to second, third, fourth century Gnostic groups, like the Corinthians, who did doubt whether Jesus was killed, but for a different reason. They didn't doubt the crucifixion of Christ because they followed the Gospels. They didn't follow the Gospels. They had their own Gospels that they fabricated, and their doubts concerning Jesus' death had to do with their view of spirit versus matter. To them, being influenced by Greek philosophy, they took the material universe as something evil, that it was no good. And so they sought to be liberated from their bodies. They believe spirit is pure, spirit is good, and redemption comes when your spirit leaves your bodies. So what did they think? Well, because matter is evil, we know Christ is divine. And if he's divine, he wouldn't corrupt himself. He wouldn't taint himself with a material body. This is why you had variety of, of flavors among Gnostics. Now, the modern use of the term Gnostic, that term Gnostic is a modern term used by scholars to refer to various groups that held various beliefs, but one thing in common that united them is their belief that spirit is pure and matter is evil. So you had two flavors of Gnosticism. You had one group that said Christ appeared in a phantom body. It wasn't a body of flesh because the divine Christ being pure would not taint himself 
by taking on flesh. And so because he had a phantom body, what's there to kill? But then you had another group that said you had a human Jesus and the divine Christ and dwelt him. But when the human Jesus was nailed, the divine Christ left him. And Adnan wants you to seriously believe that these groups were serious Christian competitors who had every right to the claim of being followers of Christ and orthodoxy as those who followed the four Gospels. So let me repeat again. There is no Christian group that followed the four Gospels that had any doubt or debate whether Christ was killed on the cross, buried, and raised physically in a set of heaven. None. So I'm going to call out Adnan's bluff. Name one group that followed the four Gospels. I'm not talking about Gnostics that had their own Gospels and for various philosophical reasons rejected the crucifixion. Name one group that believed in the four Gospels and the books of the New Testament that denied that Jesus was killed on the cross for our sins, buried, and was raised to life and ascended to heaven. You won't find them. It does not exist. Moreover, name one group at the time of Muhammad that believed in the New Testament that doubted the crucifixion. So his entire attack against the Veracity New Testament is a lie, it's deceit, because the Quran, number one, is not addressing the Gospels and their so-called contradictions. Number two, the Quran is not talking about Christians differing. It's talking about the Jews and Christians differing over the reason why Christ died. The Jews thought Christ died because he was a false Messiah. And the Christian says, no, that's not what he died. That's what you thought. But he died as our substitute to atone for our sins. And God vindicated him by raising him to life. And uh, Sam, this is, I, I normally, I mean, even, you know, doesn't matter who it is. It could be Zakir Naik, could be Ahmed Didat. I normally try to give the benefit of the doubt. I normally try to give the benefit of the doubt and say, is could this person just be mistaken here? Because um, there, there are kind of only certain certain areas where you you know the person is lying, right? Like when Ahmed Didat would tell Muslims that in Luke 19, 27, Jesus is commanding his followers to slay anyone who disagrees with him yeah. and to, to bring them there and, and to slaughter them. I know that DDOT was just flat out lying. It's not him, it's not him, you know, misunderstanding something. If you've read the passage, which he clearly had, if you've read the passage, you know this was not Jesus commanding his followers to kill. He's he's telling a parable. Um so that's a situation where this guy's not misinterpreting something. This guy's a flat out liar. And I'm trying to give, because I'll be honest, and none is one of the guys I kind of like, right? There are some guys I really can't stand. And there are some guys that I, you know, I say, Hey, if we weren't, if we weren't talking about this, you know, is, is, you know, I could hang out with this guy. He seems like a, he seems like a cool guy. I kind of like Adnan, but I'm looking at these arguments and He's clearly re he's clearly watching our stuff because he's responding to our stuff, right? Like, so he posted his first video saying that Surah 4, verse 157 of the Quran is a response to Christians. Then we called that out in our live stream and said, actually, the entire passage is, re is responding to Jews and the claims they were making. So yeah. then in his new version, he's going to see, as we're going to see in the, he's going to say, as we're going to see in these clips, um, he's going to say, yeah, yeah, no, 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 it's the first part of the verse that's talking to Jews. And then yeah, the next part of the Jews, the next part of the Jews is talking about Christians and their manuscripts without even mentioning, without even mentioning Christians, without even mentioning manuscripts that the topic suddenly, uh, suddenly changes. And uh, so anyway, the, the, in this whole situation, and then to take that and to say, to, to act like the second part of that verse is attacking Christian Bible manuscripts, Christian manuscripts yes. of the gospels, even though the Quran throughout does nothing but affirm the gospels that we have in our possession. To take that, twist it into something that's a criticism of New Testament manuscripts, and then to turn this into some miraculous knowledge on the part of Allah. You see, that how could he have known that these disagreements were in these manuscripts? How could he have known that when there's not even the slightest hint that he could even be possibly talking about that? I have to think that Adnan knows what he's doing here. And yeah. that he knows he's simply being deceptive, and that he and that he may be someone who just thinks as long as he is, uh, uh, as long as he's deceiving in the name of his religion, he's on the side of good. He's, he follows a god who brags about being the best of deceivers. He follows a prophet who said war is deceit, um, and maybe he just believes that this this sort of thing is fine.
A couple quick comments here, and then we'll check out some yeah. of the some of the uh, some of the clips from Ed Nunn that are addressing yep. the issue of the. And remind me, we do remind me to address Mark sixteen nine and twenty and John Sum because it's going to backfire against them. But yeah, go ahead. yeah, we'll do that. I just wanted to take these clips right here, so uh, th because these are related to the earlier topic. Uh, JC two uh, two fifty one says, uh, "How many people? How many people have died because of Christian expansion? Well, you can actually find all kinds of people who died as Christians expanded around the world. The point is, they're not." that has nothing to do with with christianity right you you look at you look at the teachings of jesus you never get oh go out and and kill you know slaughter people yeah. as christianity uh expands right uh, you don't get that so uh what you would say if christians go out and do something violent in the name of their religion you say you're being bad christians you're being bad christians you are not you are not truly following the gospel the gospel commands you to love everyone Right. And so what are you doing going out and, and, and killing people in Islam? If Muslims are going out and subjugating the world and people are dying because of the Islamic expansion, you can't say you're being bad Muslims. You're doing exactly what religion tells you. So you can you condemn the ideology that that promotes this sort of thing. Uh, one more comment here. Uh, what do you think about this one, Sam? Daniel uh, Babin says, is it true? Muhammad conquered Mecca because his allies had been attacked by Qureshis. No, nope. by Qureshis. That's falsehood. Yeah, that's the accusation made by Muhammad and his followers. But if you actually read, I actually have a post on this, and I think we've done a talk on it. Let me explain. Now, see again, this is going to entail a little background. Yeah, like we gotta, we, yeah, we got to do this. Okay, if you actually go to the Muslim sources, read the commentators on chapter 60, verse 10 of the Quran. Chapter 60, verse 10 of the Quran. Read the commentators, what they say about this. It's all documented. We have in our articles, answeringislam.net. Look for Sam Shimon and Muhammad breaking the treaty. Muhammad supposedly was was given revelation that he was going to make whoa, 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 whoa. Umrah. Hang on, hang on, one, one, one second, one second, Sam, because this, this, <laughs> Abdurrahman just posted it, and you're about to annihilate it. Uh, I, so I wanted, I, uh, I wanted him to, to be aware of this. Abdurrahman said, war is deceit, but don't break treaties. Did the prophet, peace be upon yes. him, ever break a yes, treaty, yes. break yes, a yes. treaty that wasn't already broken first? So Abdurrahman, you specifically challenged, did the prophet, peace be upon him, ever Break a treaty that wasn't already broken first. You have your challenge, Sam. Let's see if you can. Let's see if you can do what Abdul Rahman says you can ever possibly do. Okay, here. Don't take my word for it. Get the commentators on Muhammad's <clears throat> pilgrimage to make what's known as the lesser pilgrimage. There's two types of pilgrimages that Muslims make: Umrah, the lesser pilgrimage, and the Hajj. All right. Muhammad told his companions that he's going to go make Umrah to Mecca. So they all get ready, they get their sacrificial animals, their women folk, their children, they're going there. Before they get there, a contingent of the Meccans meet him at a place called Hudaybiyah. They stop him from entering Mecca. They stop him from entering Mecca. Now, they tell him that he can come next year, but there are certain conditions that he has to meet. And so they write out a treaty. This is known as the Treaty of El Hudaybiyah. The Treaty of El Hudaybiyah. And Muhammad had to agree to their demands. They go, you're not going to enter this year. You're going to enter next year. When you come, we'll leave Mecca and allow you and your followers to perform uh, the Umrah. <clears throat> right? Okay. Muhammad agrees. Then they also said, part of the agreement of this treaty, this treaty between you and us, if anyone defects from you to us, anyone leaves your camp and wants to return to us, you have no right to demand that we send them back to you. But if anyone defects from us to you, you must send them back. If anyone defects from us to you, now it didn't say just men, it said anyone, then you must send them back. Muhammad agreed. And then as he's signing it, he was going to write, he was going to have Ali write, Muhammad uh, Rasulullah. And then they said, no, if we thought you were the messenger of God, we'd follow you. Write Muhammad ibn Abdullah, Muhammad son of Abdullah. And he agreed. And the Muslims felt embarrassed and they were irate and upset. But anyway, let's put that aside. The Muslim sources say that some women defected to Medina. Then the Meccans came looking for the women, and then supposedly chapter 60, verse 10 came down, justifying Muhammad violating that part of the treaty and refusing to let the woman return. So who violated the treaty? 
not the Meccans, Muhammad did. So when they tell you that the reason why Muhammad entered Mecca is because of the alliances, they broke it. Muhammad had already broken his treaty and his alliance because, as he said, war is deceit. So he was a deceiver and conniver just like his God. Chapter 60, verse 10. I just gave it to you. Someone just mentioned which verse? Chapter 60, verse 10. So to correct that lie, Muslims are quite selective. Muhammad violated the treaty. He dishonored the stipulations. And because of that, because of that, Muhammad proved himself to be a, a farce, a liar, a deceiver, a conniver who didn't honor his own treaties with his enemies. So there you go. And that's not me. I'm not making it up. You can read this in the Muslim sources. Should, should I read for them or no? Or it's okay? Um, yeah. Uh, I mean, uh, Abdur Rahman, do you, do you get the point or does Sam need to uh, go further in wrecking your claim and showing that you don't know what you're talking about? And by, by, the, by the way, Sam, this is... It's it's the it's the same idea. It's the same idea, but on a bigger scale, right? Because you have oaths and you have treaties, right? I mean, you have in the Quran, in the Quran, Allah issues all kinds of commands, and you have Muhammad doing all kinds of things in in the Hadith. But one of the things that Muhammad did was he got caught having sex with his slave girl, Mary the Copt, in the bed of his wife. Hafsa, when she's out running some errands, she comes back early, catches Muhammad in her bed with his slave girl, Mary the Copt. Uh, she gets Aisha. They throw a big ruckus. Muhammad swears, I swear by the great God Allah, I will never do it again. With God as my witness, I will never have sex with Mary the Copt again. A little later, Muhammad starts having sex with Mary the Copt again, right? And, uh, and he gets some revelations to justify it. Allah says, I'm sorry, Muhammad, uh, you know, I didn't tell you to make that oath. So go ahead and break it. So notice the parallel here, right? Muhammad makes an oath, but it becomes kind of inconvenient for him. He's got this hot, this, this uh, hot slave girl walking around in front of him. Becomes, uh, you know, a little tricky. And so no problem. Got, got a revelation. Now I have to uh, break my oath. You got a treaty. You make a treaty. The treaty becomes a little inconvenient because now you're going to have to what? You're going to have to send people back like you like you agreed to. Eh, I'm not sure I want to do that. Not sure I want to do that. So I'm going to go ahead and break the oath. And so, you, dude, <laughs> you are you are following a God who brags about being the best of all deceivers, a prophet who said war is deceit. You're constantly trying to deceive your enemies. And then he indisputably breaks an oath. And here you are, 14 centuries later, saying, Aha, Muhammad is so honest, he would never break an oath. Show me where he, he broke an oath, or show me where he broke a treaty. What sort of delusional fantasy land do you live yeah. in? You live in a fantasy land created by your leaders who manipulate you into thinking that, you're, that your God and your prophet are these super honest people. And they're not. They're horrible, horrible, horrible deceivers built on a kingdom of, of lies. All right, go ahead, Sam. And just to give you one quick one, Sirat Rasulullah, page 509. I have... We have several articles on this, two in response to Basam Zawadi and one by Silas. Go on AnsweringIslam.net, Silas, the Treaty of Hudaybiyah. Here, page 509. Guys, notice how the Meccans understood the treaty. Um Kulthum, Um Kulthum, Uqba, Muayyad, say that five times fast, these Arabic names, migrated to the Apostle during this period when there was the treaty. Her two brothers, Umara and Walid, sons of Uqba, came and asked the Apostle to return her to them in accordance with the agreement between him and Quraysh at Hudaybiyah, but he would not, God forbade it. Why? Because he sent down 60 verse 10 saying, no, violate that part of the treaty. Well, I mean, what do you say, David? It's their sources, dude. I mean, uh, what, what do you, say? you know, what's amazing is you have, uh, you, ha you have Abdul Rahman here says, Muhammad, peace be upon him, had sent people back. How come you didn't mention that? You forgot. Please read Sam. We're not we're not talking about anyone uh, that Muhammad did send back. We're saying he had agreed to send all of them back, right? That's yes. the that's the agreement. Yeah. And he didn't. He refused. And he got a revelation from Allah saying, "Go ahead and break the treaty." Just like he got a revelation from Allah saying, "Break your oath to your wives to stop having sex with your with your uh with your slave girl." And so, so you've got Muhammad making oaths and treaties, and then you've got Allah saying, no, break that, break that, break that, break that, break that. And you guys today think we're making it up. We're quoting your own sources to you. Who's quoting sources here? 
This is amazing. So, uh, hang on. And check this out. Then you got uh, then you got Truth and Courage here saying, David Wood, that's not true. Truth and Courage. I do not know what you're talking about. Tell us what you're talking about right now. Uh, are you talking about what Sam said? Are you talking about what I said about uh, Mary the Cop and the Quran? Tell me what you're talking about here. Notice, notice how... Notice how patient we are with uh, the Muslims here, right? Be it's the same discussion every time. We say something, they say, no, that can't be true. Why can't it be true? You haven't read your sources. How do you know what's true or not? My yeah, leaders have never so. told me about that. And my leaders who lied to me nonstop my entire life, they wouldn't lie to me about that too. <laughs> And then we show you from the Quran. We show you from the Hadith. We show you from the commentaries. We show you from the from the Sira. We show you from your sources where we're telling the truth. And then we move. And then and then you call us liars anyway. And then we move on to the next issue. We tell you the truth. You say, "Ah, oh, you must be lying because my leaders didn't tell me that." And then we show you from your sources. We show you from your God. We show you from your prophet. We show you from his companions. We show you. We show you. We show you. And you say, oh, you're lying anyway because my leaders never told me that. What is this religion that completely obliterates your ability yeah. to read words off a page? What, what, what is it? Go ahead. Let me just read another one. So they say, well, that's here's Ibn Kathir's exposition of 60 verse, 20, uh, 60 verse 10. It's a long one, but I'm just going to read the relevant part. 60 verse, tw verse 10, not 20, Ibn Kathir. Allah abolished the part of the treaty between the prophet and idolaters about the women particularly if the treaty did not include returning women back to the meccans that defected to muhammad there's nothing to abolish right david mm -hmm. if it's not part of a treaty that if even women folk defect to muhammad you're to send them back you don't abolish it it's not part of it but it says allah abolished the part of the treaty between the prophet and the idolaters about the women particularly so he forbade returning Muslim women to the idolaters and revealed the ayamah testing them because they supposedly converted to Islam no we're not gonna send them to you but wait the deal was if they defect you you're gonna send us back you agree but no Allah said sorry abolish it that's Ibn Kathir chapter 60 verse 10 yeah now uh... Now, now look at the new claim, Sam. So Abdul Rahman said, Sam, I understand. That's good. He's actually understanding. Sam, I understand. But he did return people back, ones that were very hard, that were very hard to do. Sam, I understand. But I actually expected better from you. You are Sam. No, notice, notice, Sam, what he's what he's saying, right? These guys say, Muhammad never broke a treaty. Muhammad agreed to the terms of the Treaty of Hudaybiyah. Yeah. What one of one of those terms was which what of of which was. Uh, we will return any of your people that come over here. Then you had a woman come over, and then Allah says, no, go ahead and break the treaty. And Muhammad says, fine. I, I mean, Muhammad says, fine, I'm, I'm breaking the treaty. And so Abdul Rahman here is saying, Sam, I understand, but he did honor part of the treaty before he broke it. So what's yeah, your problem here? What's your yeah, problem here? Counts, yeah. Abdul Rahman, you said he never, you guys are saying he never broke a treaty. He indisputably broke the treaty. He broke the treaty according to the Quran. He broke the treaty according to the Hadith. He broke the treaty according to the, he broke the treaty. Muhammad did. It, it, it's like Abdul Rahman is saying, well, if you honor part of your agreement, then what are you complaining about? That's so ridiculous, dude. That's yeah. so, so ridiculous. Right? Yeah, what's there to say, man? I mean, what's yeah. there to say? So know, every, like everyone, you're, you're, you're seeing Islam here, right? So Abdur Rahman is, is fine with it, right? He's, he's fine with saying, uh, Muhammad said he would do this. And he, he kind of did it for a while, but then he said, nope, I'm, I'm breaking it. I'm breaking that. I'm breaking that agreement. And Abdur Rahman is saying, I, I, I expected better from you. I expected better from you guys than to point out that my prophet violated a treaty that we said he would never violate. Come on, dude. This is this is, I, oh dude. I, dude, e even knowing even knowing how you guys are in, in the comments, I still expect better from you if you're going to challenge us on something. Then do better than he, our prophet. He honored part of the agreement. Isn't that enough? Notice how the notice how the expectations just lower lower to the floor, Sam. Right? They yeah. they know they've got this guy who. <laughs> It's like one of the worst, yeah, yeah, yeah. one of the worst people ever, right? Yeah. He's having sex with nine-year-old girls, claiming that he got a dream that that's given her to him, right? He, he gets a revelation saying that you can only have up to four wives, and he gets a revelation saying he gets more. Uh, he lusts after uh, the wife of his own adopted son, then gets a revelation saying he can have her. 
he 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 swears an oath that he will stop having sex with his slave girl. Then he gets a revelation saying he broke it. These guys, their standards are so low for what Muhammad should be accountable for that Muhammad can even make a treaty with someone. I swear that I'm not going to violate this treaty and then come right out and violate the treaty. Can come right out and violate the treaty. And his followers are here going, how I don't understand. <laughs> I don't understand why you're why you're pointing this out. What? Well, I expected better from you guys. Why would you point out that he no. he only followed part of the treaty and broke the rest? It's amazing now, by stuff. The way, with that said, are the Meccans wrong for then? Let's assume they they wanted then to attack him. Are they wrong for wanting to attack a guy who's such a dishonest conniver who makes oaths and signs treaties and he breaks them? What would the Muslims have done? What would Muhammad have done if someone violated their treaty with Muhammad? Mm -hmm. See, because they're not seeing the implication. Yeah. They're saying, "See, the, the Meccans, they're the bad people. They're the bad, you know, the bad man. The, Me the Meccans, mm -hmm. you know, they did this and, and they forget all that their sources say. What Muhammad did to them, insult their gods, insult their family values, insult their traditions, embarrass them, and they kept saying, "Please, you can talk about Allah." Pre preach about Allah. Well, listen, please stop attacking us. Please stop embarrassing us. We don't want to fight with you. We don't want problems. We don't want to come to blows. We don't want violence in Mecca. They're the ones actually going the extra mile to try to make peace. Muhammad, no, no. I've come to bring slaughter if you don't accept me as the messenger of Allah. And even on top of that, he goes to Mecca, Medina, folks. He goes to Medina. They leave him alone. They don't pursue him. He still doesn't leave them alone. He attacks their caravans robs their property, ends up killing some of them, and then starting the first war between the Meccans and the Muslims. Muhammad did it, not them. And then on top of that, he signs a treaty, he violates a treaty, and still the Meccans are the bad people. They're still the ones that are bad. They're the ones who are evil. Muhammad is the, it's It's a classic case of narcissism, man. Isn't this narcissism? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Um, oh my God. this is this is nuts man all right let, let me uh, let me check out uh, uh, let, let me go through a couple comments here so this is truth and courage I asked truth and courage uh, he said we're lying I said what what are we lying about and he said you are lying against my prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam <laughs> we're asking what in particular <laughs> I don't when I say what are we lying about we don't mean oh you're lying about my prophet right we're not saying what in the term of who we're lying about we're saying what did we say that is a lie Right. So, so we're only kind of talking about a couple things. One is like jihad and uh, and Muhammad violating the treaty and so on. Uh, the other was the only other thing I mentioned was I mentioned Muhammad having more than than four wives breaking that and mentioned that Muhammad got caught having sex with his slave girl and uh, got in trouble over that. And then he broke his oath. Uh, that, those are the only things we're saying. So I'm asking, what are we lying about? You keep saying it. Notice it's you guys are liars. What are we lying about? Well, we can't say what you're lying about, but you're liars. Okay, we said a bunch of things. Which one of these things are we lying about? Yeah. Well, you're lying. <laughs> Look, it's it's very simple. You said this, and it's false. Can you defend what you just said? And if we can't, then then the question would then be, where are we getting this information from? Speaking of lying, let me give you an example. Algebra here said, Algebra said, Muhammad, peace be upon him, did miracles, which prove he is Allah's prophet, and you guys know it. Two lies there. One, that Muhammad did miracles that prove he's a prophet, yeah. and two, that we know it. Because what do we know, Sam? What do we know about Muhammad's miracles? If Muhammad did miracles, then the Quran is the greatest fraud ever produced by an individual, because the Quran, from beginning to end, keeps repeating the same assertion when the people are asking Muhammad for miracles and it says the signs and miracles are from from my Lord but <clears throat> he sent them down to previous generations and they rejected them for example if you go to chapter 17 verse 59 17 verse 59 and 29 50 to 51 just two of many passages that yeah there are signs from my Lord my Lord can do miracles but he refrains from sending them down because the previous generations rejected him so notice the convenient response of Muhammad. When he's asked for a miracle, yeah, Allah can send down a miracle. Well, we know he can. We don't have a problem with Allah. We know he can send it. But we want him to send down a miracle to, ver to verify that you are his spokesperson. Yeah, he could do so, but he refrains from doing so because the people before me saw miracles and they still rejected the messenger. So what's the point? Wow, that's an X. See, David, I can now prove I'm a prophet with that manner. David, I'm a prophet. 
and I would show you a miracle, but what's the point? Because the prophets before me, they did miracles and people didn't believe, so I'm not even going to waste Allah's time, you know, and I'm not going to waste my time. But I'm a prophet nonetheless. That was Muhammad's argument. Yeah, how do I convert to Shamunianism? Because he made such a great case. Yeah, that's what it is. And it's repeated all throughout the Quran. And you know what, folks? If you believe Muhammad did miracles, then you just prove the Quran is insufficient. Why? Because in 29 verses 50 to 51, 29 verses 50 to 51, the argument goes like this. Isn't the Quran a sufficient miracle? Because they're asking for miracles. And what is Muhammad's response? The Quran is a sufficient miracle. Folks, if the Muslims insist that Muhammad did other miracles, that means the Quran lied by saying, this is a sufficient miracle. You don't need any other miracle because the Quran is enough to prove that Muhammad is a prophet. But if they want to argue he did other miracles, that means the Quran is wrong. It wasn't sufficient. It needed miracles to back it up. You can't have your cake and eat it too, Muslims. Um, now... I'm not sure. Guys, we need to know. We need to know if this was a from an actual Muslim or from someone who's just... Because uh, sometimes, Sam, I don't know if you've noticed this, but sometimes people uh, post an objection. Oh, some, someone, someone's even saying algebra, was, was, al, was algebra's, <laughs> was algebra's uh, comment sarcastic. So this could have been one of the sarcastic ones. Um, <laughs> but, uh, lots of times, Sam, people toss out an objection, not because it's a Muslim tossing out the objection, uh, thinking we can't respond to it, but sometimes people just want us to, uh, start making fun of, start making fun of Muhammad. So actually got one of those on the issue of, uh, who said we're lying about Muhammad wearing, uh, a girl's clothes. So let's see it here. Uh, no, I, I, I want to know is this. Back on that one. I want to know if this is serious. If it's serious, we'll respond to it. If it's a joke, guys, we understand sometimes it's fun to uh, to get off on the tangents, but we do we do want to finally get through these uh, uh, non Rashid clips. But Noel QB says you're lying that he wore dresses and was constantly covered in semen. So Noel, is that is that a joke or are you actually saying we're lying about that stuff? Because if you're saying we're lying, then we will uh, we will take a look at it. So let us know. Let's see. Other net, we're about to jump on some stuff. Mm. By the way, guys, does anyone know is Noel QB uh, a Muslim or is that you know Christian or atheist or something like that who's just messing around? Yeah, let us know. You seen any response? No, no, I maybe I don't. I hope uh, it was a joke because they're gonna really be sad if they open up this can of worms. <laughs> they're gonna be really, really sad. <laughs> Man, you know, I mean, articles I have on this one documenting from Arabic dictionaries and lexicons that mert and thobe all mean dress, clothing, not blanket or a bed. You're gonna be sad. You'll be sorry. Surprise, David. Glory to God. We're close to fourteen hundred. All God. right. Uh, I'm not seeing a response. Uh, yeah. We can always we can always come back to that. If someone wants to let us know if that is a, a serious, a serious objection to us. Other than that, Sam, you want to take a look at a couple more Adnan Rashid sure. clips? Yeah, yeah, because I want to. After this series, Adnan will have to retire from apologetics. So let's just d dismantle his final arguments because I'm going to come back, guys. I'm going to okay. talk about Mark 16, 9 to 20, and John 7, 53, 8, 11 backfires against him, Lord Jesus willing. Let's hear the next clip. Hold up. Here we go. Oh, you got it? Uh, say so. Oh no, Noel is yeah, they're joking. Yeah. Yeah. Here's no here I'm I'm laughing at something else. Check this out. So uh so Noel uh Noel says it's a joke, guys. So Noel yeah, yeah, Noel yeah. was okay. joking. We were hoping it was because th those are exactly the sorts of things Muslims say we're lying over, right? No, you 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 can't show us that. And so it, it is it is kind of funny. But then Allah prays. <laughs> Allah prays said your prophet was garbage. So so he's you got Allah's Allah praise going after Noel. Uh, who was who was joking about, <laughs> yeah. about Muhammad? I, I recognize Noel now. Yeah, then yeah. I forget the joke because I know Noel comes yeah, out. Yeah. Of no, that's that's what I thought too. But I, I wasn't I wasn't sure. I wasn't sure. So, um, all right, all right. You ready to check out a clip? What? Uh, oh, and, and by the way, Sam, someone told me there is a feature. Remember, because you can't you can't be listening to the clips here. Someone said there's actually a feature on Ecamm where 
you can you can listen to the clips as I'm doing those. So I will I will figure that out, and then and then we'll have we will have that problem solved, and that's cool because uh, a lot of what a lot of what we could be doing is just every new video a Muslim comes out with attacking the Bible or defending Muhammad, we just watch it and and point out all the flaws. Yeah. That would be fun. All right, ladies and gentlemen, we're back to the mighty Adnan Rashid, who's going to tell us uh, about the miraculous. Knowledge of the Quran that Anan has inserted in there, even though Allah says nothing remotely resembling what Anan says. So, do you think Muhammad had the ability to sit down and read all the four Gospels and do an assessment on the text of the Gospels and see that they are in conjecture, they are in difference, uh, they are conflicting with each other? The four authors of the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, are in conflict with each other when they are describing the details of the crucifixion. How would Muhammad know that? How is it possible? So, it is clear that the author of the Quran, who is God Almighty, knew well that there are people who have written about the crucifixion and the crucifixion is false, it never took place. And how is it false? Because they themselves are in conjecture, they themselves are in conflict. And this is very, very clear in that very verse. So the first part of the verse refutes the Jewish claim that we have killed the Messiah. The first part of chapter 4, verse 157 of the Quran refutes the Jewish claim that the Messiah, Jesus Christ, the son of Mary, the messenger of God, has been killed. They claim this. Then the second part of the verse deals with a different group of people. Who are they? As for those who differ with each other. As for those... So it is clearly not talking about the Jewish people because they do not differ with each other. They are in unanimity that they are the ones who killed the Messiah as the Talmud claims. The Talmud clearly claims that the, the Christ, Jesus Christ, was killed by the, by, by the Jewish community of Jerusalem. That's what the Talmud claims. So that claim is dealt with. The second part deals with a different group of people. As for those who differ with each other. Who are those who differ with each other? <sighs> who are those who differ with each other? Yeah. Well, you have, uh, you have, you have a couple of different interpretations here. You have a couple of different interpretations. The, the way, the way I, the way I always read it was just, um, the Jews say they crucified Jesus and I am saying they didn't, and those who differ therein, if you're if you're disagreeing with me, well, you're following yeah. you're following only conjecture. That's one. Uh, That's right. The other way is to say no. Jews are saying that that they crucified and killed him, and uh, Christ, Christians are saying uh, the only thing the Christians would be disagreeing with them is about you know why that 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 certain Jews of Muhammad's time were claiming that this somehow disproves him as the Messiah, whereas Christians are saying, no, 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 this is actually part of God's plan. So that's where the that's where the disagreement would yeah. come in. It's just the idea that this is talking about differences in the Gospels, and Allah is 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 talking about the, the differences in the text. Adnan has to know this is, this is absolute nonsense. He has to. Adnan yeah. cannot be spouting this kind of nonsense without knowing, wait a minute, I have a bunch of followers who follow my, my Muslim channel, and they will believe any sort of nonsense I say as long as I start saying, and it's miraculous knowledge, how could Allah have known this? And yeah. uh, again, I, I pointed this out on the, on the last live stream we did the other day. It reminds me of the first video I ever watched where a Muslim was trying to convert me to Islam, and it was about science. And someone would talk for minute after minute after minute, talking about, you know, the 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 digestive system of a cow, and then would say, and Allah says this, so how did Allah know all of that? And it's like, what? where did he say any of that? Where did he say that stuff, right? And here you have Anand doing the same thing over and over again. He says a bunch of stuff. Knowing that Muslims all agree with it. Ah, oh, the Bible contradicts itself. The Bible contradicts itself. You all agree with that, right? And and that's what Allah is saying right here. I can't actually prove it. I can't actually even make a good argument for it. But I'm going to say it knowing that you guys will not challenge anything I say because you mindlessly agree with me because our religion has encouraged 
mindless yeah. obedience in you. I know you're not going to disagree with me, so you're just going to believe it, and this will comfort you and your religion as these people continue to attack it. All right, Sam, what do you, what yeah. do you think here? There's several ways to attack it, and you just uh, <clears throat> pointed some of the ways that you can attack this argument showing that Adnan is being dishonest with his own Quran, and ironically, Adnan is doing to the Quran what the Quran accused Jews and Christians. He is falsify falsifying misinterpreting the text by his tongue. He's deliberately perverting the meaning of the Quran to his shame in order to deceive people to thinking that the Quran does not confirm the scriptures of the Christians, those scriptures that testify the Lord Jesus Christ died, was buried, and was raised to mortal life. Now, with that said, <clears throat> folks, if Adnan is right, the Gospels are contradictory. He just again proved Muhammad is a fraud. I want you to understand what David is saying and what I'm saying. There is nothing in the entire Quran that says that Muhammad thought the scriptures were full of contradictions, were <clears throat> unintelligible, corrupted, and not reliable. Nothing. The opposite is true. Go back and listen to the previous sessions. Listen to David's shorter videos, especially on chapter 2, verse 79. You're going to find Muhammad repeating himself like a broken record, like I do, which I'm forced to because we've got to answer the same objections over and over again. You Jews and Christians, your scriptures, I bear witness and I testify, and my Quran testifies. Whatever scriptures you have, the uncorrupt, the incorruptible, pure words of God, that God has preserved, that you are to live up to, that you are to judge by, and even judge me by those very scriptures. But now if Adnan is right, those scriptures contain contradictions, he just proved Muhammad didn't know what he was talking about because Muhammad confirmed scriptures that are full of contradictions, which means they cannot be from God, which means Muhammad could not have been speaking from God unless Allah is an ignoramus and Allah didn't know what was in the Bible and the scriptures of the Jews and Christians so that Allah himself is confirming scriptures that are full of contradictions. So Adnan again ends up destroying Islam, destroying the Quran. He's doing what the Quran said people were doing at the time of Muhammad, shredding the Quran, chapter 15, mm -hmm. verses 90 and 91. He is <clears throat> removing words from the right places by his tongue. He's doing the very thing that the Quran accuses Jews and Christians of doing to their scriptures with their tongue, not with their pen. The text is incorrupt. And he's doing the very thing that a group of people at that time were doing to the Quran, according to 15, verses 90 to 91. So let me repeat again. If Adnan is right, the Gospels are full of contradictions. Muhammad is a fraud. He's a false prophet because Adnan knows more about the Gospels than his prophet did. Because contrary to his spin of 4157, Muhammad never said, your scriptures are full of contradictions. Your scriptures are not reliable. Your scriptures are corrupted. He said the opposite. They are incorruptible. They are uncorrupted. They are the words of God. You are to live according to those scriptures, judge by them, and even judge me according to those scriptures. So thank you, Adnan, for helping us prove Muhammad is a false prophet because he believed one thing about the Bible, you believe another thing about the Bible, that is full of contradictions, so if you're right, he's wrong. But Adnan, if Muhammad is right that the Bible is the word of God, then you're wrong for positing contradictions. They may seem to be contradictions, but they can't be real contradictions. They must be har harmonious, and therefore you must harmonize them if you agree with your prophet, unless you want your prophet to confirm scriptures that are full of contradictions. But that still leaves you in a problem, Adnan. Here's the problem. If you agree with Muhammad that the Bible that the Jews and Christians were reading is the uncorrupt, pure words of God preserved, then that means you must accept my Bible today, because my Bible is identical to what they're reading at that time. But if you agree with Muhammad and accept my Bible, then you end up with Muhammad being a false prophet and antichrist for contradicting contradicting the theology of the Bible, the Christology of the Bible, it's teaching about Jesus, the pneumatology of the Bible, it's teaching about the Spirit and the message of salvation. So Adnan, damn if you do, damn if you don't. And finally, finally, folks, when Adnan brought up Mark 16, verses 9 to 20, and John 7, 53 to 8, 11, I want you to challenge him to answer the following question, because he hasn't responded to our challenge to debate me. Hopefully he will. So go on his comment section, go on his Facebook and ask Adnan, Adnan, the scriptures of the Jews and Christians at the time of Muhammad, 
did their scriptures have the longer ending of Mark? And the answer is yes, because 99% of the manuscripts of Mark that have Mark 16 include the long end, longer ending, Mark 16, 9 to 20. And the majority of manuscripts do include John 7, 53 to 8, 11. It's the earlier ones that lack it. But by the time of Muhammad, most of them, if not all of them, most of them had it. And you even find this being recited and read in the liturgies of the churches at Muhammad's time. Folks, you know what that means? Now, David and I are free to follow where the evidence leads. If these are interpolations, well, that means nothing is lost because nothing stated there isn't repeated or reiterated somewhere else and not, nothing stated there affects the core doctrine of the Christian faith. We're free to let the manuscript evidence guide us into whether this is part of the original or not. But now he's got a problem. He believes that Mark 16, 9 to 20 is an interpolation because he's following that particular school of textual criticism that says that it is an interpolation. Bruce Metzger, Bart Ermey, you name it. He believes that the adult, the pericope adultery, the story of the woman caught in adultery, that wasn't originally written by John. Even though people like Bruce Metzger believed it's an actual historical event, it's an actual tradition that was then inserted in the manuscript tradition to preserve it because it's an actual event in the life of Jesus. That means he ends up condemning Muhammad again. And folks, please understand my point. What do I mean? If Muhammad confirmed the scriptures in the possession of the Christians at the 7th century, and he goes, your scriptures, the uncorrupt word of God. And if those scriptures included Mark 16, 9 to 20, and John 7, 53 to 8, 11, that means Muhammad is saying, amen, those, those verses are genuine verses because they're part of your scriptures that I confirm are the uncorrupt words of God. Muhammad again stands condemned by Adnan, because according to Adnan and his scholars, those are not generally part of the Gospels. They're interpolations. Muhammad didn't know they were interpolations. So he amend their veracity when he should have known better. So you end up with Muhammad again confirming spurious passages that were not inspired by God, proving that he's a fraud and the Quran is false. Adnan, I thought you're trying to help Muhammad, not destroy Muhammad and expose him for the Antichrist he is. I hope my point was clear, David. You want to repeat it for them to understand? Go ahead. Um, no, I mean, if 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 Adnan is right in what he's saying, then as you pointed out, he knows more than his prophet and his God, and he's a better speaker than his prophet and his God. Um, over and over again, he tells us, "Ah, here's what Allah is saying." When we can't find anything remotely resembling what Adnan is claiming that Allah is saying in the text. All we find, Allah's clear statements are all affirming our texts. And so if Allah's method, when he wants to say your Bible's been corrupt, is to constantly praise and affirm the inspiration and the preservation and the authority of your text, but to say in massively ambiguous terms, up, oh, but those who differ therein, and in that he's actually talking about the, 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 the manuscripts that he's already affirmed over and over and over again in the clear passages, then once again, Allah is the absolute worst communicator in all of history, and we can only wish that Adnan had been his spokesman uh, back in the 7th century instead of Muhammad. And uh, I, I really would have to say that Allah should uh, use some, some of his miraculous power, bring Adnan all the way back in time to when he's, uh, he's giving the Quran from all eternity, speaking it out, and get Adnan to say what he actually means, because Allah is really, really bad. Hey, yo, Sam, you want to see something funny? I was going to give you something fun here, but go ahead. Uh, I was going to show By you Abdur something. I was, going to, I was going to show you something funny. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Even with Abdul Rahman, you're going to laugh at this. I, one, I, I, was, I was only going to show this. But I, I'm going to have this in a video. But By the way, guys, I, I should be posting a video around 11 o'clock p.m. tonight. It's on how to interpret the Quran, but it's on how basically how Muslims interpret the Quran and the methodology they use. But uh, uh, I had mentioned in a previous live stream, we were talking about the shredded Quran. And I said, man, someone should make a graphic of like a Quran, but like with abs, because it's shredded. Yeah. <laughs> and, someone did uh, that? Yeah, not a verse. Not a verse went ahead and sent me this. Let me see if I can get it up. And as, yeah, as you, you put go. it up, 
<laughs> as you put it up, you want me to tell you what I've done? You want to be shocked and hit, bang your head against the wall as you put that up? Yeah, go. Well, it's it's already up there. You're on a delay, so you'll see it. You'll see it in a few yeah. seconds. But yeah, go ahead and tell me what Abdurrahman said. Abdurrahman, guys, you want to bang your head against the wall, and you know that it has to be the Holy Spirit to set them free because the influence, the demonic influence, is strong, and only the Spirit can set them free. Look what Abdurrahman actually had the audacity to post. Where does Allah? say unequivocally, unequivocally that the Torah and the Bible would not be corrupted. <laughs> yeah. Uh, my goodness. Uh, dude, how many different ways can Allah say it? Right? I mean, it's like Allah is saying, how can I make it any more clear to you? Right? Every single clear passage we have is saying just that, right? He says he inspires the Torah and the gospel. He says that no one can change his words. He says it repeatedly. He says in Surah 7, verse 157, that Jews and Christians still have the Torah and the gospel. He tells uh, he tells Jews that they don't need Muhammad because they have the yeah. Torah. Only makes sense if, they, if it's in an uncorrupt form. Uh, he tells Christians to judge by the gospel. He says we have no ground to stand upon unless we stand upon the Torah and the gospel. Muhammad agrees. Jamia Termidi says that Christians and Jews still have the gospel and the Torah. Um, th th I think you're missing the point, Abdur Rahman. The point is every single clear verse is affirming our, our scriptures. If he's actually, if in all of that, if in all of that, he's actually condemning our scriptures and saying they're corrupted, as Anand says, and as almost every Muslim we encounter says, shouldn't there be one clear verse saying otherwise? Just one? Shouldn't there be yeah, one yeah. somewhere? And you can't show us one. And every time you try to show us one, we actually go into what the verse means in context and so on and find out that it can't possibly mean that. And we're, we're telling you, I mean, dudes, I wasn't joking the other day when I called you apostates. When I call you when I call you apostates, I'm not I'm not I'm not even joking here. You, you, your your God can sit here and tell you something in 50 different ways, and you'll just deny it all. Nope, because it's not what we want to believe. That wouldn't that wouldn't make us feel good, because we we want we want to we want to be the ones who are mocking. We want to be the ones who are mocking the Bible. We can't do that if our God affirms it. So who cares if He says over and over and over again like a beating drum that He's affirming our scriptures? So what? Let's just let's just say, oh, right here he said three, so he must have been attacking manuscripts of the Bible. Oh, he said he said uh, there's some sort of dispute over the crucifixion. Uh, yep, he must be talking about the the gospel differences in the in the different manuscripts and so on. Are you joking? I mean, are you seriously joking? No, but understand the logic, guys. Look, mm -hmm. I mean, if I was a Muslim, I'd be offended at what he said because understand the implication. He wants us to actually believe that his God Allah sent down the Torah and the gospel specifically to be corrupted because if he didn't want it to be corrupted he would have said that the Torah and the gospel are not corrupted so wait Adnan let's let's follow you uh, Abdul Rahman I'm sorry see I'm even thinking it's Adnan you sound you sound even worse than him you seriously want me to show you a passage where it says the Torah and the gospel were not corrupted when we made a positive case to show that the Quran says the Bible remains as it was revealed it's pure it's uncorrupted but you really want to take it that far for me to then quote where the Quran says the Torah and the gospel will not be corrupted why would the Quran need to say that when the Quran assumes it's been preserved and by saying it's preserved it doesn't have to say that it's not corrupted it says it's preserved it can't be corrupted because it's preserved. 6.115 none can change the words of Allah but you really want us to believe Adnan this is what you want Adnan See, I mean, because I keep thinking this is something Adnan would say, but it would. It here, is. Yeah, and I don't want to attack him. He didn't say it, but Abdurrahman, you really want us to believe that the entire purpose of Allah sending down the Torah and the gospel was so that it can be corrupted, because that's basically what you want me to show you to show you where Allah said the Torah and the gospel are not corrupted. When in fact, if the Torah was sent down from Allah and the Gospels were sent down from Allah, didn't he send them down to be guidance and light? And wouldn't he make sure to preserve them to be guidance and light for the Jews and Christians and then use those scriptures to condemn them for failing to live up to that guidance or light? But then how can you then vindicate Allah condemning Jews and Christians for failing to live up to what God revealed, Allah revealed, if they were corrupted because now they have excuse before God. Folks, understand the implication of this teaching. 
Abdul Rahman has now given Jews and Christians an excuse before God. What's the excuse? But God, the scriptures are corrupted. We're simply following scriptures that ended up being corrupted, but we didn't know they were corrupted. How can you be fair and just in condemning us by following the scriptures that we had no clue were corrupted, and now we find out they're corrupted, and you're going to condemn us for believing that your words cannot be corrupt? Your words have been preserved, and there are sure guidance and light for us to follow? Are you going to blame us? We thought they're not corrupt. We thought that they contain guidance and light. And then Muhammad didn't help the, ma the matter any, Allah or God, whoever you want to call him, because Muhammad then comes and says, your scriptures are guidance and light. Your scriptures are to be used to judge, and you are to live up to those scriptures and use them to judge me. And if you don't follow your scriptures, you are no better than an unbeliever, a rebel. So I'm really confused. You're going to send me to hell for living up to scriptures that are corrupt, and we had no clue they're corrupt, and Muhammad didn't help us in thinking they're, that they're corrupt, because he actually convinced us they're not corrupt, and you're going to send us to hell. Wow. That's the religion. Sorry, I don't mean to get loud, uh, but wow. Um, persecuted, uh, persecuted CT in the super chat earlier, um, made a, uh, point. I'm going to quote right, right now. Uh, persecuted CT said, uh, really Adnan, which Jews acknowledge that they already killed the Messiah? Jews mm -hmm. are still waiting for the Messiah. Yeah. That's kind of a side point. And, and it, and it's, uh, we bring this up, we bring this up pretty, uh, pretty regularly. Uh, and I would connect it to basically the same thing you have in uh, Surah 5, verse 116, and the same thing you have in Surah 9, verse 30. In Surah 9, verse 30, Allah says that Jews say that Ezra is the son of Allah, and it's in a parallel fashion to the way Christians call Jesus uh, the son of God. And it's just amazing, show me a Jew who calls Ezra the son of God in any any way that would parallel the way Christians call Jesus the Son of God. Uh, two, you have in, uh, as we've mentioned many times, in Surah 5, verse 116 of the Quran, where Allah finally gets around to trying to refute the doctrine of the Trinity, and it's a Trinity made up of God, Jesus, and Mary. And here you have in Surah 4, verse 157, Jews supposedly bragging about killing the Messiah. It says, we killed Christ Jesus, the messenger of Allah. So according to, according to the Quran, that's what Jews were bragging about, and the Quran then goes on to try to refute them. Um, the, kind of the reason for bringing this point up is, is that, I mean, notice, how are we supposed to take this seriously, right? Anan, Anan tells us, basically, this is how we're supposed to go to Surah 4, verse 157. We're supposed to go to this verse. Um and the way he does it, the way he did it in an earlier video was to go and say that this verse is, is trying to refute Christians. So we pointed out, no, if you actually read it in context, it's it's meant as a response to Jews. So then he comes back with his response and says, ah, only the, it's only the first half of the verse that says it's responding to Jews. The second half of the verse, even though it doesn't say who in the world it's talking about, uh, is responding not simply to Christians, but to the Christian manuscripts. It's, it's stacking that, even though it doesn't mention texts, doesn't mention uh doesn't mention um, corruption of text, nothing doesn't mention, but somehow it's about that. And we're all supposed to ignore the absurdity of these various passages, like Surah 4, verse 157, Jews bragging that they killed the Messiah. Um, uh, Jews in Surah 9, verse 30, uh, saying that they, uh, they have Ezra as the son of God. We're just supposed to ignore all of these obvious blunders in the Quran. And we're supposed yeah. to go to this verse and conclude that the second part of this verse is responding to Christian textual variants, and that Allah is sort of smuggling that thought in there, even though every single clear statement Allah ever makes only affirms our scriptures. And guys, I, I, I've said it a thousand times before, I'll say it a thousand times again. If that is your God, he is such an awful communicator that if I believed in him, if I believed in your God, I would still not know what to believe. If you're telling me, if you're telling me that your God is the worst communicator in all of history and you tell me, believe what he says, I can't figure out what he says. I can't figure out what he's saying. He's a guy who can say, judge by the gospel. And his followers tell me, no, he's saying, don't judge by the gospel. It's been corrupted.
Hmm. He, he, he's a God who says you can beat your rebellious wives into submission. And Muslims just tell me, no, he's, he's saying don't beat your wives. He's, he's a God who says fight those who do not believe. And you say, oh, no, no, he's saying only fight in self-defense. You're telling me that your God is constantly saying the exact opposite of what he means and believe in him. Well, why am I going to why am I going to believe when he tells me to believe in this or not to believe in that? If he says the opposite of what he means, should I just go through the Quran and believe the opposite of every single thing he says and, and base my beliefs on that? What should I do? I can't really figure it out, guys. All right. Yeah. Okay. All right. All right. You ready? Uh, now, Sam, we, we, we did have, I don't know if these are from Muslims or from, from, uh, from non-Muslims, uh, but uh, earlier when we were talking about miracles, so, Sam, before I even put these up, I put this up, but you're on a delay. If, uh, if they wanted to respond that the Quran does say that Muhammad performed miracles, what are they going to say? They're going to say split the moon. Yeah. What, what else? If there was one more. There, there actually, there's another one that the Quran says does he did the miracle? Yeah, yeah, yeah. The Quran. Wow, now you got me stumped on that one. Uh, really? yeah, the, yeah, the, the, it's, it's well, it's because it's, it's so dumb that that you would not even think of this as a miracle because you know you already know the response. But the night journey, <laughs> the night, the night journey. That one's yeah. that one's actually so bad that yeah, uh, that's going to actually embarrass Muhammad and expose him as a fraud. Mm -hmm. All right, All right, let's let's give some quick responses on this. Now, yes. notice just right here from again. I don't I don't know if these are uh, Christians, atheists, whatever Muslims bringing these up, but um, uh, the yeah. as we pointed out, the Quran claims over and over and over again that Muhammad had no miracles except the Quran itself. So the response here, Surah fifty four, verse one: The hour has drawn near, and the moon has been cleft asunder. And then in parentheses. The people of Mecca requested Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam to show them a miracle. Yeah, so he Muslim. showed them the splitting of the moon. Well, now, yeah. the MW six three five. That part is not actually in the Quran. The Quran. Yeah, yeah, that parenthetical part is them trying to show that this refers to a miracle. Why? Because if you just read the text, it doesn't say anything about Muhammad having anything to do with anything. All right? It says, the hour has drawn near and the moon has been cleft asunder. Now, imagine, I woke up to you and I say, the, the, the hour has drawn near and the moon has been cleft asunder. What in the world am I talking about? Well, yeah. you don't know, and neither do the Muslim commentators. You can go to Muslim commentaries, and they say this is just referring to the uh, the judgment coming, right? That Muhammad is always talking about the impending judgment. The judgment is here. The judgment is here, and he gives all these warnings. And here he's saying we're so close that the moon the moon has been split in half. That's how close we are to the judgment. You can open your Yusuf Ali Quran, and it gives that as one of the interpretations that Muslims have come right. up with now. It is very common among Muslims to say that this refers to Muhammad splitting the moon. Uh, what are your thoughts on this, Sam? Now, here's the thing. Uh, obviously, these Muslims are not paying attention, and they didn't listen carefully. If you're saying 54 verse 1 is referring to the miraculous splitting of the moon, something not found in the Quran, but found in sources written over 100 years after the death of Muhammad, you just admit the Quran is contradicting itself. I don't, I don't, I don't, it's again, it's baffling. You guys don't see it. Hopefully by the grace of Jesus Christ, enabling you to see it. You understand if you show me a miracle in the Quran, that means you just created a contradiction. Mm -hmm. But according to chapter four, verse 82, one of the ways to falsify the Quran is to find contradictions in it. So I gave you just two of many verses, 17 verse 59, 29 verse 50 to 51, where it says, signs were not given to Muhammad. Allah refrained from sending the signs because they wouldn't believe in the signs anyway, because that's how the people before Muhammad responded when prophets did miracles, prophet performed signs. And it says the Quran is a sufficient sign, a sufficient miracle. You don't need anything else. 1759, 29, 50 to 51. So if you just prove that the Quran is referring to a miracle other than the Quran itself, you just prove the Quran is full of contradictions and is insufficient as a lasting sign to vindicate Muhammad's prophethood. Good job, BMW. Thank you for proving the Quran is full of errors. The Quran is not sufficient and therefore end up proving Muhammad is a false prophet and the Quran is a false book. But weren't you trying to prove the opposite? No. Good job, buddy. <laughs> no, no, Sam, I think... Uh... <laughs> <laughs> I think all of these are trolling comments because uh, someone's are, so, some people are saying uh, uh, BMW is a is a Christian from New Zealand, so uh, oh, that's why I, getting us animated, that's why that's why I said yeah I think because they they want us to respond to stuff because we have a similar one here 
uh, this is Venom. Uh, but Venom says, what about the one time when he flew from the uh, Haram Mosque to the Aqsa Mosque, yeah, Mecca to Jerusalem? It was mentioned in the Quran. That's uh, 17 verse 1. That's a nightmare. That mm -hmm. is a nightmare. Now, number one, if you read chapter 17 verse 1, it says, glorified be he. Glory be to him who took his servant by night. From, it says, the inviolable mosque to the farthest mosque, Masjid al-Aqsa. Glory be to him, glorified be he, who took his servant by night from the inviolable mosque, Masjid al-Haram, to the farthest mosque, Masjid al-Aqsa, whose precincts we, we bless in order that we might show him some of our signs. He is the seer and the knower. Okay, number one, the text doesn't tell us who the servant was. Re let me repeat again, folks. Listen carefully. By the grace of Jesus Christ, our Lord, how to destroy this argument. Number one, who is the servant? We're not told. Number two, where is the inviolable mosque? The inviolable mosque. Masjid al-Aqsa. We're not told. The Quran doesn't tell us where it is. Number three, where is Masjid al-Aqsa? <clears throat> the farthest mosque. None of that is stated in the Quran. None of that is mentioned in the Quran. So now, if you go outside of the Quran to fill in the blanks, that's going to create even worse problems for your position. Do you know why? Because if you need to go outside of the Quran to make sense of the Quran, you again prove that the Quran is a fraud, the Quran is a lie, because the Quran repeatedly says it is in plain Arabic a scripture that provides full exposition of all its verses. It fully explains everything. For the sake of brevity, I'll just give you several verses. What does the Quran say? It's in plain Arabic, and it provides a fully detailed exposition, fully explains, explains everything in detail. It explains its verses in detail. Write down chapter 6, verse 114, chapter 6, verse 114, chapter 12, verse 111, chapter 12, verse 111, chapter 16, verse 89, Chapter 16, verse 89, and finally, chapter 41, verse 3. Chapter 41, verse 3. However, the moment you go out of the Quran to tell me what the inviolable mosque is, what the farthest mosque is, who the servant is, you prove the Quran is a lie from the pit of hell because it doesn't explain everything in detail. It doesn't provide a full exposition of everything, of all its verses, because you need outside sources to make sense out of it. But then it gets worse. I'm a charitable man. I'll allow you to go outside of the Quran. When you do go outside of the Quran, it says, yeah, it was Muhammad, but it says Muhammad was taken from the Kaaba. So there, the sources identify the inviolable mosque, Masjid al-Haram, as the Kaaba. And then he flew on a mule. Well, it wasn't a mule. Yeah, it was a mule, I believe, because it says, it was, yeah, anyway, on an animal called Burak, with Gabriel accompanying him to the temple in Jerusalem. And the Islamic sources even go into detail that he he took his flying animal and then he, he tied it to one of the doors, entered inside the temple, and all the prophets were there, and he led them in prayer, came out of the temple, got back on his animal, and with Gabriel flew to every single heaven, seven heavens, until he finally met Allah, whom he saw as light. Folks, historically... This is a fact. There was no temple in Jerusalem at the time of Muhammad. The temple of Solomon was destroyed in 586 BC. The second temple was destroyed in 70 AD by the Romans with Titus as the general of the Roman armies. There was no temple in Jerusalem at the time of Muhammad's supposed journey. And then Masjid Al-Aqsa... Uh, oh, I wanted to. Uh, I wanted to. Uh, I wanted to bring in Venom's comment here because apparently he is actually defending this. He said uh, Muhammad's description of the monuments he visited was pretty accurate, despite not visiting any of it ever in his life. Uh, well, no, he posted this a little earlier, but yeah, Sam. So, 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 just reiterate the point. Muhammad starts talking about the door and the windows, yes. and none of this is there that he supposedly. There is saw. no temple for him to enter and pray in. What temple did he enter in except the temple of his overactive Im imagination? So what you just proved is Muhammad was quite inaccurate. He lied through his teeth, or this is a tradition written after the fact, because that leads me to the other point. 
There is a mosque in Jerusalem called Masjid al-Aqsa. Masjid al-Aqsa. But that was built around 691 AD. About six years after Muhammad's reported death. That means you can now make a strong case, folks. And Lord Jesus willing, I'm doing some research to examine of all the extant Quranic manuscripts, how many of them have chapter 17 verse 1 and how old they are. But you can actually make a strong case that either this part of the Quran was added later to the manuscript stream after Masjid al-Aqsa was built to legitimize Jerusalem as a stronghold or one of the places that belongs to Muslims. Or you can say that this reference to Masjid al-Aqsa was then used by Abdul Malik to then create such a mosque in Jerusalem in order to legitimize what the Quran said. But either way, Venom, you just destroyed Muhammad and exposed his fraud. He never went on any journey. And you exposed that this part of the Quran is a fabrication. If it was written before Masjid al-Aqsa was built in 691 AD, then that means Muslims decided to build a mosque and name it after this verse to legitimize this verse. Or this verse was added later to the manuscript stream to legitimize Masjid al-Aqsa after it was built. Either way, you buried Muhammad and the Quran. Glory to Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. Now, Sam, um, Ab <laughs> Abdul Rahman here says... Uh, Abdul Rahman says, How is Quran 29, 50 to 51 saying there can't be miracles from Muhammad, peace be upon him? Can really can you read it, Sam? I don't think he understands. Uh, I don't think he understands his point at all. So, okay. guys, yeah. Surah 50. But, yeah, I just want to explain to him. Surah 54. Surah 54. Muslims tell us this refers to Muhammad being challenged to perform a miracle and so he went out and split the moon Even though it doesn't say one word about Muhammad having anything to do with that And even though that there are even Muslim commentators who will say that this is about you know This is a sign of the impending judgment or something like that. They'll say nope. It was Muhammad performing a miracle That's as of the revelation of Surah 54 several years later Allah reveals for instance, Surah 29 and many other passages where Muhammad continues to be challenged as to why he isn't given miracles like the people who came before him. Now, if Muhammad had split the moon in their sight, then the response should always be, what are you talking about? He split the moon. What more do you want? Instead, that never comes up. They're always just excuses as to why he isn't given miracles. And notice, if Muhammad had ever been performing miracles, uh, 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 Abdul Rahman, he's 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 using the same approach. He's using the same approach uh, uh, they keep using, right? Over and over again, he's challenged. Why can't you perform miracles? Why aren't you given any miracles? Why are there no miracles from you? And over again, over and over again, it's oh, I'm just a warner. I'm just a warner. You know, other people were given miracles. They didn't listen, so Allah doesn't want to give me any either. I'm this. I'm that. Oh, uh, isn't it enough for you that I brought the Quran? And so Abdul Rahman wants to say, ah, but where does it say he's not, he doesn't, he can't possibly do any miracles. So I, I just don't know what to do here, right? We, we, have, we have the Muslims claiming that Muhammad's performing miracles left and right. We have throughout the Quran, Muhammad being challenged, why do you have no miracles? And over and over and over and again, like a beating drum, it's because I'm just a warner. I'm just a warner. I'm just a warner. And then Abdul Rahman is saying, but where does it say he can't? Well, I, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm guessing I'm guessing you could say he, he could and that Allah could, Allah could give a miracle if he wanted. He just didn't when it came to Muhammad. But go ahead, Sam. Yeah, let me read this. Uh, Abdul Rahman, after I explain this, don't insult my intelligence because then I'm going to assume that you're a deceiver as well. Here, let me read it again. Folks, help me, help me to see if you're getting the point. I don't expect the Muslim to get unless the Holy Spirit by the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, enables them to see. Here, let me read it. Yusuf Ali. I'll read any one, but I'll read Yusuf Ali for now. If you want me to read something else, Abdul Rahman, I will. Guys, pay attention. Yea, they say, why are not signs sent down to him from his Lord? That is a stupid question to ask Muhammad if he's been doing miracles. If I've been doing miracles and I did 50 miracles, it makes no sense for people to say, why aren't miracles being done by Sam? Uh, hello? I just did 50 miracles. 
I just showed you 50 signs. What do you mean? Why aren't signs given to me? This only makes sense if Muhammad did no miracles, but let's continue. Why are not signs sent down to him from his Lord? Say, the signs are indeed with Allah, and I'm indeed a clear warner. Yeah, Allah can't do miracles. And I would say, no da, Muhammad. If Allah's God, and he's the true God of the Bible, of course God can do miracles. We know that, no da. We're not saying that miracles are with God, and we're questioning that. We're questioning you. If God sent you, why didn't he give you the grace to do miracles? Here's the reason, 51. And is it not enough for them that we have sent down to thee the book, which is rehearsed to them? Verily, it is mercy and reminder to those who believe. So guys, catch what 51 just said. After saying, the signs are with Allah, signs are with God, right? But I'm just a warner to you. And is it not enough for you that I have this book that I recite to prove I'm a prophet? Now, you guys understand the implication of this, right? Muhammad is saying, this book is sufficient to prove I'm a prophet. The reason why Allah hasn't given me miracles is because, number one, those who came before me when they did miracles, the people still rejected them. But more importantly, I got this book and I'm reciting it. Isn't that enough? Now here, what Abdurrahman wants me to believe is, no, it's not enough, because that's what he's saying. No, Muhammad, it's not enough. Well, if it's not enough, that means Muhammad's argument falls flat to the ground, because his excuse is, you don't need miracles, you got the Quran, that's more than enough, you have no excuse. Now, you guys are getting the point, or is it just me? Maybe I'm stupid, and I'm seeing a point that's not there. Yeah, Sam, uh... And by, by the way, Sam, it, it's over and over and over again, like a beating drum in the Quran, right? And and so, uh, Abdul Rahman, try, try and get your, your mind around our, our, our deep reasoning here. Our deep reasoning is, if Muhammad is going around performing miracles like he is in the later Muslim sources, the Quran doesn't make sense. And once again, your God is the worst communicator in all of history. <laughs> and, he, he, and it makes it makes no sense. Right? It makes absolutely no sense. If throughout the Quran, over and over again, people are walking up to Muhammad, hey, we, we can't figure out, we've been around you for years, and we can't figure out why you never, ever, ever perform a miracle like, like other people could. And over and over again, the response is some excuse. Well, because of this, or because of that, or because I'm, an, I'm just a warner, because of this, because, you know, Allah gave miracles to people before, and they still didn't believe None of that makes any sense if Muhammad was performing miracles. There was one, they should have been, they, 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 it should have been this, this common, this utterly common accusation against him that he couldn't perform miracles if he's performing miracles. Two, the response from God should have been, what are you talking about? In addition to the Quran, he shot water out of his fingers, man. He split the moon. <laughs> he split the moon, man. What are you talking about? Are you guys blind? Are you stupid? He did it right in front of you all. But you don't have anything like that. You just have denial after denial after denial and so uh yeah, yeah. don't know what to do that oh, here you go here you go sam i don't know i don't know if this is supposed to be a, a joke or a joke or not but uh act 17 apologetics i saw the water springing out from underneath his fingers till yeah, all of fun. till all of them no this is different this is a different person uh i saw the water springing out from underneath his fingers till all of them performed the ablution it was one of the miracles of the prophet Notice, in other passages, you got his followers doing their ablutions with water that had uh, dead animals and used menstrual cloths and human feces in it because they didn't have any other water. And here you have him uh, shooting water out of his fingers to, uh, so that they could perform ablutions. And of course, this written two centuries after the time of Muhammad. Yep. Yeah, by the way, I just want to say something. Venom, how in the world can you have a mosque after 70 AD when to speak of mosque is anachronistic. What mosque would they have after 70 AD when there were no Muslims, contrary to your fairy tale Quran? I mean, these guys are unbelievable. But yeah, I, I'm hoping this guy's joking about the, because folks, you understand again? Uh, yeah, yeah. Glory to Jesus Christ. Our Lord is risen. He fills us with the Holy Spirit because it's only by the power of the Holy Spirit he can give us the grace to endure this. Folks, quoting the Hadith, let's say he's serious. Let's say communicate, or however you pronounce his name. Oh, yeah, it's communicatio idiomato. Oh, this is, yeah, he's a Christian. He's making fun, man. Yeah. This is the communicatio idiomato. But let's assume 
let's take this as if it was a Muslim. Do you understand when you go to the Hadiths, which are over 100 years after the time of the Quran, you're only proving that the Hadiths contradict the Quran? If the Quran clearly says no signs given to Muhammad, and the only sign he needs is the Quran, but then you go to the Hadiths where he did miracles, that means the Hadiths are contradicting the Quran, and unless you want to throw out the Quran, you're going to have to throw out the Hadiths. So, okay, you choose. All right, Sam, well, we've been going a long time yep, here. Yep, yep. Should we... Uh... Should Whatever you want to do, man, because we had about 14 and not too bad, but uh, they're getting tired of stinking and they're probably getting tired of Adnan as well. But hey, whatever you want to do, if you want to play another clip, you want to close down, it's up to you. I'm free. Let's so. check out. Uh, let's check out some super chats and then we'll. Uh, All right. We'll call it a night. All right. The Nehatu said, David, do you know where is Muhammad now? Um, yeah, I can tell you where. <laughs> where. Where do you think he is, Sam? Oh, let me guess. He's in Jannah with all those whores with swelling breasts. He's under the feet of Jesus Christ. He's in everlasting damnation and destruction. He's under the wrath of Jesus and deservedly so. The Lord Jesus has condemned Muhammad, and Jesus is Muhammad's God, judge, and destroyer. He is clinging to the hair on Satan's back in the lowest pit of hell, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, Pentecostal Judas 1.3 says, Dave and Sam, shame. Muhammad revealed. Muhammad was revealed in Galatians one through six through nine. <laughs> He's saying exactly. you do have a prophecy of Muhammad. We, yep. I, I agree. Uh, Ron M with the uh, picture of a, of, of a <laughs> it's a book, it's a book and a heart and a goat. <laughs> we know what that means. We can translate that. Um, Mira Susie said Adnan is late night comedy. Uh, thanks for posting. So uh, we got some people thinking that Adnan is the. Uh, is the Muslim Eddie Murphy with his, his comedy act. Uh, Legend says, uh, Hi, David and Sam. We are watching you with my brother, even though he doesn't understand uh, English very well. We like watching you guys. God bless you. Amen. Lord Jesus bless you too. That's good. He's watching. He's watching. Uh, he's watching. He's watching Sam, even though he doesn't understand English very well. So that just means he's like Sam being all animated. That's right. Um, man. Big Boss says, "Querdy asked, when are you going to release the top ten plagiarized verses? Um, is that something I said I would do in a live stream at some point and then totally forgot about? If it is, I mean, because it sounds like something I would say, top ten plagiarized Quran verses or something like that. Uh, I don't remember. I don't remember saying that, but I do know that I'm this unstoppable fire hose of good ideas that come out of me all day, and then I forget like 98 percent of them." Until someone comes along and reminds me and says, hey, when, when are you going to do that thing? Um, so, yeah, but that sounds like something I would do. Uh, uh, Deepak says, Mr. D. Wood, Jesus says, whoever commits sin, he or she is a slave to the devil. Allah treats his followers as slaves. This line uh, is perfectly matching. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, you have Allah. And that is the, the Islam is supposedly the religion of submission to Allah. And according to Islam, the highest relationship you can have with God is a slave to master relationship. That's right. And and Sam, there, there there are interesting connections there, isn't it? In the hadith where Allah says that if people didn't sin, he would destroy them. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah because Allah needs to be glorified and he's needy and he wants to show his his characteristics. This again, that we need to do a session on this, the philosophical implication of this, because this confirms one of the arguments, philosophical arguments that Craig and others use for God being triune, it's because of love. Notice the implication. Allah wants to show mercy. There are hadiths you'll find where Allah is said to have deliberately created mankind to sin because if they didn't sin, he would wipe them out. Now notice the injustice here. Sinless people he's going to wipe out. Why? Because he wants sinners to exist so he can then be given the opportunity to show mercy. So that shows you, number one, that even Muhammad in his warped, perverted, twisted mind realized that the characteristics of Allah required objects for those characteristics to be realized. In other words, if he's merciful, then he needs someone to be merciful to. But then he needs someone to give him a reason to show mercy to. So that's why Allah created human beings to be sinful. This is actually Hadith, and we have articles on this showing this is the logic of Muhammad. So isn't it interesting, David, that Muhammad in a weird, warped way, way understood the philosophical implication that if if Allah is merciful and loving, that requires an object. But since he didn't believe in God's multi-personality, even though the Quran does hint at God being multi-personal, even though it's not the true God, he had to then posit 
the existence of sinful creatures, needy creatures, for Allah to be who he is, making Allah dependent on his creation. Weird, isn't it? Mm -hmm. um, so Tajik says, uh, everyone, please pray for an end to Islam. Magic Man says, Islam is not a religion, but a black stone worship cult. Uh, Tatiana J with a bunch of uh, emojis here. Ben Remember, Wa she's a Syrian, brah. She's an Assyrian warrior. Lord Jesus bless her. Ben Wagoner yeah. says, David, please reach out to one godless woman. In my opinion, your subscribers would profit by hearing her story and her warnings about Islamization. Uh, yeah, so she sounds like an atheist, but uh, yeah, I've had many atheists uh, who are ex-Muslims on um, giving their story. Uh, Abdullah Samir, Armin Davabi, um, uh, the apostate prophet, of course. So yeah, I'm totally fine if, if she ever wants to do a do a show and share her story. Uh, she can she can uh, she can come up. Alwin Furtado says, uh, I misunderstood about Hinduism comment a few days back. Hinduism doesn't have a concept of conversion, but what I think is since the Bible has this strange repulsion and misunderstanding of this ideology, it should be uh, discussed. Well, I mean, you know, it's just, yeah, as far as Hinduism, uh, yeah, there, yeah, Hinduism should be discussed as far as discussing it on this show, we don't study it, and therefore we're probably very unlikely to discuss it. We don't like to discuss things that we don't we don't uh, we don't study. Um, Philippians two ten says, "Okay, I will post in English. God bless both of you. Raised up for such a time as this, David, Sam, CP, uh, Smith, and the Dean Zechariah, and Brother Rashid." Amen. Ben Wagner. Oh no, I already read that one. Uh, Fadhili Washburn says you should make a shirt that says "Surprise, David." <laughs> Surprise. <laughs> I need to make Surprise. there's two shirts I gotta make. Surprise, David. Uh I was blocked by Sam Shimon, shirt that says that, and then all the people who are blocked by Sam Shimon can get the shirts, and then a cup that says jihadi tears. I want that one. Matthew Holmes says, plus they say Allah is all powerful, yet they limit his power in Islam. Um uh, let's see. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Hindu historian, Jaco Ben. Uh, Cheryl R. says, Howdy, y'all. God bless. Looking forward to a civil discussion and to get schooled, as always, by David and Sam. Uh, uh, Anita, true gospel. Sam and David are gospel gangsters who slay all day. Keep dropping knowledge, guys. Uh, Adisho, George Wagoner. All right. I think we got through them. All right. Well... Even Abdurrahman M wants that shirt. I got blocked by Sam Shimon. Hey, he's got good taste. Nice, nice, nice. Uh, Truth spoken. Yeah. Truth spoken today said, "Will you two be broadcasting in a studio again?" Yeah, we. Uh, yeah, willing. yeah. I've talked about this. This is a plan for the, uh, for Jesus the name. for the future. Um, Sam and I are in currently in different parts of the country, but the plan is to move to the same area. Uh, soon as Amen. that, soon as that happens, put together a uh, put the put to get put a studio together and start going live from in there That's all right. right all right sam final thoughts yeah well again guys uh please do pray and praise the lord jesus we had still a good crowd i mean we had up to 1400 but more importantly we don't just want i don't just want numbers i want people to learn this stuff not just come to be entertained learn this material absorb it make it second nature and then you use it to reach muslims and strengthen christians until we see every Muslim realize Muhammad is a false prophet, the Quran is a false book, and their only hope of salvation is to trust Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. So folks, take the information, study it, master it, absorb it, and apply it in the power of the Holy Spirit for the glory of Jesus Christ. And keep praying for us. Pray for David, pray for me, pray for his spouse and kids, pray for my daughters, because you don't believe the amount of spiritual attack we undergo. It's not a joke. David can testify, others can testify. Even now, as I was live streaming, live stream, that's why I got distracted. I got a lengthy text being attacked by someone. I can't mention names. This is constant. The warfare is real because Satan is real, but Jesus is real, and he's almighty over Satan. And as long as we're in love with Jesus, covered by his blood, filled with the Spirit, we will be more than conquerors. And amen. Come, Lord Jesus, we love you. Have mercy on us, forgive us, and strengthen us to finish the race for your glory. Christ is risen, risen indeed. So I love you guys, and Lord Jesus bless you guys. Uh, Sam, maybe if you were nicer to people, then people wouldn't be so mean to you all the time. 
You ain't lying. Pray for that too. <laughs> hey Sam, yeah. not a verse here. Now I have to post not a verse's comment since she uh since she made me an awesome graphic, which yes. will be again in the video coming out tonight. Uh I still have to edit it. But uh not a verse says, Sam, have you mentioned your upcoming stream yeah. on Jay Dyer's channel this That's Friday right. at six o'clock PM Eastern Standard Time? Well, he just mentioned it. So Lord Jesus willing, go to Jay Dyer's YouTube channel, subscribe. He's actually an Orthodox, a convert to the Orthodox Church, and he's a philosophical beast. Very well read, very well uh, studied in philosophy and quite articulate. And he's been a great job of destroying the Islamic concept of Allah through philosophical arguments. So hopefully I can be a blessing to him this Friday by the grace of the Lord Jesus. So pray for that. That will be powerful and blessed to glorify the triune God. Father, Son, and Spirit, the Lord Jesus, the Son of God. Amen. Um, oops, one quick comment here. Marco Conti said, uh, David, what happened with the person that worked as a secret agent against Al-Qaeda that you mentioned? Oh, yeah, that was, uh, yeah, I have to find out if he wants to go live. He actually told me that he's doing some sort of stream on another service and then I can watch that. So, yep, I'll check that out. But, yeah, I'll, uh, we'll get back to that. Hey, wait, that's you. Is that you? Yeah. Wait, no. Oh. No, no, no. It has, sim has, a similar, it has a similar name. All right, yeah. I'll figure that out. All right. <laughs> All right. I was looking. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you got me by full too. All right, everyone. Well, I uh, will see you very soon. Again, Amen. new video popping up here uh, probably in an hour or so. I will catch you all next time.